gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning from Padang, West Sumatra, Indonesia. It is uh, indeed great honor and a privilege to me become your host today. Uh, let me you know, I am Silmi Yusri Rahmadani. I am from Andalas University. And <clears throat> I am is the MC for today's seminar, International Seminar, with the theme of Building Network and Research Collaboration. Yeah. In light of step forward collaboration between Andalas University and Kosyung Medical University. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Almighty God, who has given us a time and a blessing to attend this virtual webinar. And also let me send our salawat to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to our Prophet Nabi Muhammad SAW by reciting Allahumma salam Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad. And ladies and gentlemen, I would like to extend my very warm welcome to Head of Biology Department, Faculty of Mathematics and Natural Sciences, Andalas University, Bapak Dr. Wilson Novarino. And also my very warm welcome to our speakers today, keynote speakers today. Uh, they are Professor Dr. Dewi Imelda Rosma, Dr. Ko Chen Yun, Dr. Su Yong Cho, and Dr. Huang Yin Se. And also welcome to uh, all of the professor in a biology department and also professor in Faculty of Mathematics and Natural Sciences, Andalas University. And also welcome to all of the lecturer and academic staff and also student and biology uh, Faculty of Mathematics and Natural Sciences. And a special best regard to all of the participants in today's webinar. Thank you for joining us in this webinar. Ladies and gentlemen, without waiting any longer, let me kick off our uh, seminar. Uh, let me begin our first uh, seminar by reciting Basmalah, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, may Allah uh, make our uh, webinar run smoothly and give uh, so many abundance of uh, value and feedback. Ladies and gentlemen, let uh, we here the first speech by head of biology department faculty of mathematics and natural sciences please welcome bapak dr wilson novarino terima kasih banyak bu simi thank you terima kasih uh, good morning professor su professor kuo professor huang is this are you ready with us professor Devi, our uh, speaker uh, for this seminar uh, this morning and also terima kasih banyak untuk kehadiran bapak bapak dan ibu ibu semuanya. So uh, a little bit information for Professor Su and Professor Ko. Our participant this morning is not only for from biology department in Andalas University, but also from uh, our colleagues uh, in several university in Indonesia. Uh, some of them from the East Indonesia, some of them from Sumatra, and also from the uh, Java and Borneo. Uh, and so on. So, uh, on behalf of uh, biology department and Dallas University, I would like to say thank you very much for all of you uh, to spend your time join with us during this seminar. Uh, as uh, I informed before, uh, this seminar actually it is kind of the introductions before we are getting more in touch with the Kaohsiung University uh, uh, in the future. We would like to set up kind of the uh, networking uh, regarding with the research, studying, and other things. Because in the future, without networking among us, it is very difficult to expand our ability, our knowledge, and uh, also uh, for the, our future. So uh, I'm really, really appreciate that you uh, spend your time join with us and let's uh, make this seminar will be very fruitful 
not only to improve our knowledge, but also to improve uh, and also our engaging uh, our collaborations among university in Indonesia and also to other university in the forex country. Uh, our speaker this morning uh, will be uh, focused on the uh, what we are talking about, the biogeography of the biodiversity. Uh, and also, uh, in the meantime, when we are discussed about the biogeography, it is not only what already we discussed before or we are reading uh, from the manuscript that's uh, published by uh, Alfred Russell Wallace a long time ago. Uh, molecular, bio uh, my, uh, my molecular biology have a good impact on the, our uh, our ability to understand about the biogeography. So uh, we hope from the this seminar we will get a more uh, wide uh, perspective to understand the biodiversity in Indonesia, in the Asia, and also in the world. I'm really sorry about the, uh, it is quite noisy maybe uh, for all of you, because I, uh, this morning I got a uh, jump and uh, uh, traffic, so I just stopped uh, <laughs> just uh, beside uh, the main road, so maybe it, it quite uh, noisy, so I'm sorry about it. Uh, but I, I just make sure that uh, I will be available on time uh, for this uh, uh, seminar. So, uh, dengan mengucapkan Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, uh, in the name of God, uh, let's start our uh, seminar this morning. Terima kasih banyak sekali lagi. Saya kembalikan kepada Ibu Simi. Thank you very much. Terima kasih. Uh, thank you very much to Bapak Dr. Wilson Novarino. Ladies and gentlemen, let me know you a brief of today's webinar agenda. <clears throat> let me start to this uh, webinar. <clears throat> In this webinar, it's divided into two sessions with the four speakers. And the first session will be moderated by Ilham Kurnia. And the speaker is <clears throat> Professor Dr. Chi Yun Ko. And Professor Dr. Chiyun Ko will talk about predator learning and the paradox of warning signal diversity and integration of modeling and meta-analysis. Welcome, Professor Dr. Chiyun Ko. Okay, and the second is Professor Dr. Dewi Imelda Rosma. Professor Dewi will deliver about freshwater fish geography on the uniqueness of the waters on Sumatra. Welcome, Ibu Professor Dewi. Okay, <clears throat> and the second session will be moderated by uh, Dr. Rilaldi. And in this session, uh, will be delivered by Professor Dr. Su Yong Cho. And Dr. Su Yong Cho will talk about application of uh, phylogenomic and population genomic tools to biography and ecological adaptation in cases of arachnid and insects. Uh, and the second is sorry. and the second is Dr. Wang Hinse. Dr. Wang Hinse will talk about in resource for the food and guts. Ambrosia symbiosis between beryl and fungi. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, well, we start for the first session. The first session will be moderated by Ilham Kurnia. Hello, Ilham. Kur Hello, Ilham. Hello. Oh, yeah. yeah, I'm here. Okay, Ilham, uh, time and right. screen will be yours, please. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wilson. Thank you very much for all of the speaker. That willing to share their experience and research in different kind of uh, field in biology and, and life science. And uh, thank you for the audience uh, attending this uh, very short seminar, the seminar that we can improve for uh, sharing our knowledge. And uh, okay, let's begin for the first speaker is Dr. Po. He is talking about, as the uh, uh, MC mentioned, that he is working the ecological behavior, diversity, and its implication 
for the effort to carry. And in the face of the climate change that we need to uh, more information about the behavior or about the uh, animals and fitness in the current environment situations. And uh, uh, I will give a time and place for uh, to uh, sharing his research more, more mostly on litter or some insects around the Taiwan and uh, American side, like the American continent. Uh, for Prof Go, please, time and place is yours. Oh, well, thank you, Johan. Um, yeah. So I'll share my screen. Let me know if this works for everybody. Is everybody seeing my screen? Yes? Yes, clearly, Prof. Okay, great. Okay, then I'll start. Um, Okay, so well, it's great to be here, and uh, it's you know I'm happy to see uh, you know all these colleagues and maybe students from Indonesia. It's very nice to meet you guys online, um, and hope we can do this in person once the pandemic's over. So today I'm going to be talking about um, something a project that I've been working on recently, which is about how we can resolve the paradox of wanting to university with predator learning. Now I do this. Uh, by combining uh, theoretical modeling and meta-analysis from the literature. Um, and I, I, I chose this topic uh, not only because it's something that I, I'm pretty excited about and also uh, you know, it's a recent project, but because this, even though this, the things I'm gonna talk about is, is mainly just modeling and, and you know, analysis of the literature data, but down the line, I wanna do some field experiments in Taiwan and potentially also in Indonesia. And so maybe after this talk, if you have any ideas um, where and you know um, what kind of system might be suitable over there and I'll be happy to hear your thoughts. Okay, so let me just dive right in. So before I start, I, I think just from the topic alone, I, there's a lot I, I need to unpack probably. So first of all, what are warning signals? So warning signals are, you know, uh, how can I hold on? Okay, so, ooh. okay. Well, this is the picture is not showing, but anyway. Um, so warning signals are, you know, a lot of prey are unprofitable predators, and the reason for that can be, you know, many things. Uh, it can be because the prey uh, is noxious or just tastes bad. In this case, it's a, it's you know, it's a, it's a, it's a skunk that would just spray this very noxious chemical from their, uh, you know, from their rear end to the predator. So it's not very, it's not, it, it's not a good thing for a predator to attack this kind of prey. Or, you know, a predator can, a prey can be toxic. Uh, the picture that was supposed to be here is the poison dart frog. So those frogs are toxic. And so uh, if a predator eats the frog, it might just feel very really sick or even, even dies. So obviously that's very bad. Or, you know, a prey can be, can do less harmful things, but still be unprofitable. For example, like a weevil seeing here, it's really hard to consume. You know, it would take a, a lot of time and energy just to crack open the, you know, the exoskeleton. And also a prey can be hard to catch, hard to capture. Showing here is a, is a morpho butterfly, uh, you know, who's really good at, which is really good at flying and, and the fly pen is kind of erratic, it's irregular. So it's very hard for a predator to catch the butterfly. So all these prey, all these prey uh, because they are unprofitable, they evolve very conspicuous colorations on their bodies to warn the predators about, you know, I'm not good for you. You're going to waste your time or there'll be bad consequences. Just don't go after me. And predators very often can, can learn to associate this very obvious colorations on the prey's bodies to their unprofitability. So the reason why this works is uh, something that you you all you all probably know already. It's called condition, it's called you know, associated learning. And one way this can happen is through classical conditioning. So I think all of you here probably knows um, you know, per, the Pavlov's dog, right? So uh, how this works is that you, uh, you, you present a dog with a chicken. It's gonna salivate because it recognized as a food. And you know, before this conditioning, you ring a bell to the dog, the dog doesn't respond because the bell means nothing to the dog. But if you, you know, during the conditioning, if you present the chicken and also immediately after that you ring the bell, 
through the process, the doc we learned to associate the ringing of the bell, the sound of the bell to a food item. So after that, when the process is complete, you ring the bell without presenting the chicken, the dog will salivate. And this is because the conditioning is complete. So the dog now has associated a neutral stimulus, in this case, it's a sound of the bell, to something that's meaningful, uh, which is food, even though the food is not actually here. Okay, so the same thing, you can just switch off the, the dog and the bell, the chicken, to something like this. So I'm using a toxic butterfly as an example. So a uh, butterfly has toxin. Uh, well, some, some pictures are missing again. I don't know why. But showing here, it's, it's supposed to be a bird, just, you know, just, just here. And before conditioning, if, it's, if, if the, the bird eats a butterfly, it's going gonna, it's gonna to vomit. It's going to get sick. Uh, but before the conditioning, when he sees the pattern, this, you know, this red and yellow pattern, it means nothing to the bird. But throughout its interaction with this kind of prey, the bird will learn to associate this red and yellow color pattern with toxicity and with bad consequences of vomiting after eating it. So after the condition is over, the bird will learn to avoid anything that looks like this. Any, any butterfly that flies that has a black background with a, you know, a, a red stripes on the four wings and yellow stripes on the hind wings, the bird will just not eat it. So this is the, the class of conditioning behind this, uh, the, vo the avoidance learning. And this is how warning signals work. Okay, so, um, you know, people have thought about this for a long time. So, you know, this idea was not proposed yesterday. So, uh, in, in, I think, I believe, um, 18th century, 19th century, actually, a guy named, a biologist, a naturalist named Muller, uh, he had this idea about how to explain, how to actually, you know, theorize the, uh, the um, warning signal, how that works. So his theory was that, well, so attack probability of a native, of a naive predator towards a prey that's unprofitable starts out as 0.5, meaning that the, the, the predator would just attack this prey randomly. It doesn't, it doesn't avoid, it doesn't prefer, it just attack at random. So the attack probability towards that kind of prey is 0 0.0, is 0 0.5. And with every interaction, it's, it's gonna, the, the attack probability is gonna decrease to an, a final asymptotic value. And what the, what the value might be depends on a lot of things, but if it's avoidance, then this value is gonna be below 0.5. Okay, so we consider, you know, like I said, a final attack probability of lower than 0.5 to be avoidance. Now, so for predator to complete conditioning, this learning process, a fixed number of prey have to die. Because with every interaction, it's gonna, it's gonna bring down the attack probability you know, to a certain amount until at the end, it reaches this final probability. So in the process, a fixed number of prey have to die. But at the same time, the predator may forget the learned avoidance if it doesn't interact with the prey. So with every passing time where a predator doesn't encounter this prey that he's learning, he's gonna forget about, oh yeah, there's the link, this link between the appearance of this prey and the improbability of the prey. Okay, so uh, when a signal becomes locally more abundant, uh, the bearer of the signal has two, has two benefits. One is that because the signal is now more common, uh, it will be more effective at, at educating the predators because it provides more opportunities to predators to encounter this kind of prey to reinforce this learned avoidance, this connection between this pattern, this color, and the improbability of the prey. And also, because like I said before, you know, for the learning to complete, a fixed number of prey have just have to die. So if you have more individuals bearing the same signal, it's going to dilute the risk that, you know, you are going to be the sacrifice, uh, you know, that, that, that has to be made uh, for the learning to, to, to be complete. Okay, so 
this has a very profound uh, implication, which is that if you follow the logic, um, it would mean that over time, over time, um, the natural selection would eliminate all signals that, that are not the most common in a single location. Because the more common the signal is, the more fitness advantage it's going gonna, it's gonna to give to the bearers. So eventually, all signals that are not the most common is going to go away. And here is where the paradox is. Because we see a conflict between theory and reality. So like I said, theory predicts that you know, if you go to any, any given location, you should see, if you just look at the warning signals that are there, you should see the signal homogeneity. So one type of signal in one location, maybe there's another, maybe in different location, there's gonna be a different signal, but one location, one kind of signal. But when you go into, the, go into nature, any, everywhere you look, it's, the, it's mostly the opposite. So we see a lot of times when, a lot of examples where multiple, very distinctive warning signals coexist in the same location, stably over a long time. So this is obvious, obviously uh, you know, a, a puzzle. It has been for a while. And again, this is not to say that theory is wrong because you know, we do see signal convergence in a lot of systems. For example, here on the left is the poison, poison dot frog. And there you, you do see, you, know, you, you see a lot of different patterns coexisting in the same location. But on the right, you see butterflies, which is, you know, those are toxic. And, Different locations have different warning signal. They look different, but you do see, for example, like you know the ones on the lower left corner, uh, they do converge. They are different species, but they do evolve to look very similar uh, at the same location. So you know this. Um, if you look like, if you happen to look like the most common signals, it's going to give you a benefit. That's there's no doubt about that. But again, that doesn't that doesn't. Um, explain why we still see a uh, warning signal diversity you know, in a given location in a lot of places, in a lot of different uh, taxa, different systems. So apparently, you know, obviously, this, this needs to be explained. And people have tried to explain this. I want to just point out that I want to, I'm going to come back to this at the end. OK, so you know, people try to explain why this, how this can happen. Why would there be a, a a conflict between theory and, and, and uh, reality. So one obvious explanation would be, okay, well, you know, maybe there's special heterogeneity of predators and prey. So for example, if you look at the big map, you see, okay, well, there are multiple different signals in a same location, but if you really look into that, you might see, okay, maybe this, you know, signal A uh, exists in this patch A right here, and then signal B exists in this patch B. So on a broader scale, they coexist. They, you know, in the same location, but they don't really actually coexist, uh, you know, in a real sense. And certainly, I mean, this explains some of the scenarios, some of the cases why we see signal warning signal diversity in some locations. But also, again, very often we see different barriers of different signals just existing, flying, walking around side by side without obvious spatial or temporal segregation. So this is one explanation, but it's not, it doesn't solve all the problems. It doesn't solve all the puzzles. Okay, so the second uh, possible solution is how predators learn. So, you know, uh, a, a paper published in, in, in a few years back have tried to use a different, uh, a more sophisticated learning theory to explain this. Because of, you know, due to, we don't have enough time, so I won't go into more detail about what they did, but I urge you, if, if you're interested in, in this kind of stuff, go read this paper, because it's really elegant and it's, it's really insightful. And it's, it was inspiration uh, for the projects that I, I'm gonna be showing you today. So uh, please go read it if, you, if you're interested. Uh, but basically, what their idea is that uh, they figure out, okay, so multiple signal signals can coexist in the same location if, if, uh, if you look at the cost-benefit ratio of the prey and also how many prey uh, that community or habitat 
can accommodate, which is the carrying capacity of the location. So in the, this region here is that, well, under some combinations of this cost to benefit ratio and chem capacity, you do see a coexistence of different warning signals. So number three here, this lighter region is where that is possible. So this is great, right? But when you try to use this, their results, to explain what's happening in real communities, you're gonna run into problems really, really fast because A, these two parameters, the cost to benefit ratio of the prey and the current capacity of the prey, they are really hard to quantify. Imagine how you can measure, if you have a you know, community of your interests and you wanna go out and actually measure, use their theory, their results to, to, to try to um, figure out whether predator learning is maintaining the warning signal diversity, it's hard to do because how you measure the C to B ratio and the current capacity. It's almost impossible. So as insightful as, as, this res, as the results are, uh, sadly, this is one of the cases where, you know, something that exists in a theoretical vacuum, which means that it's, it's, it's all, you know, nice and, and very elegant, but it's, it's almost, it ha almost has no real life applic applicability. You can't really use it uh, in any of the real communities that you're interested in. So, that's a you know that's that's unfortunate. So, and also the other thing is they their idea. One of the the reason they they wanted to do this is they didn't think the Mueller's idea can actually work. Um, again, I won't go into detail about this, and I'm happy to talk about this later on if anybody has uh, you know is interested and wants to know. But basically, uh, uh, hold on, hold on a second. Sorry. Okay. So basically, if you think of, uh, if I, you know, just imagine, do, let's just do this thought experiment. If I, if I give you a bowl of MMs, I think a lot of people like chocolates, right? So MMs are different colors, right? So if I ask you, okay, please pick out, please just eat everything except the blue ones. And you do what I, what I told you to do. And then halfway through the bowl, you know, I told you, okay, well now, don't eat the red ones too. If you really follow my instructions, then at the end, you end up with a bowl with only, not only just the blue M&Ms, but the red ones as well. And this is really the idea that inspired me to really uh, you know, explore this possibility of, uh, well, if the predator can learn to avoid, if they can remember the learned avoidance uh, well, then maybe that would allow that, itself will allow multiple warning signals to coexist. In this case, it's, you know, MMMs of different colors. Okay, so what I want to do here is that, you know, I want to see if Mueller's idea really cannot lead to signal diversity, which is what these authors claim to be the case. Um, but I, 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 I had my doubts. And also, I think the Mueller's framework, I think, is, is superior to theirs because you know, they can provide a, a, a framework where empirical data from learning experiments can be used to test the theory, which is something that you cannot do using, you know, the, the, the framework that uh, these two authors developed earlier that I, that I showed you. So if I can establish this framework, I can actually, you know, collect a learning data from predators, either, you know, my own, doing my own experiments or just getting data from uh, experiment that people have done and have you know have been published wouldn't that be nice okay and also i can assess using these results i can assess the potential of predators to uh, for allowing um for local warning signal diversity and i'll i'll show you how this can be done in the in the slides that follow okay so before i do that i want to explain how this learning how you can actually quantify uh, you know, describe the learning process with a with a simple model. So, like I said, you know, before the learning starts, a predator can they attack a prey with just 0.5 probability. It's random, right? It either attacks or not. It's totally random. So, if the prey is unprofitable, which means that ultimately the probability is going to be somewhere below 0.5, and it's going to have a, a final value. Say it's right here. So with every interaction, it's going to bring down the attack probability. Well, it's you know, uh, I'll just use I'll just say p from now on. 
save me a lot of time. So it's going to bring down P from 0.5 to a, a value that's lower and lower and lower until it reaches this final, uh, final P. And in the absence of interactions, it's going to forget, which means that the P is going to be, it's going to go from whichever value it is, it was at, at that time, at the, at the moment, to go back to increase gradually towards 0.5, uh, denoting, uh, you know, with uh, the blue dots right here. And then if it counters the, again, it's going to decrease uh, the, the P, you know, towards this final value. So this graph here shows you how learning and forgetting uh, can also both and can both come into play in the learning process. And uh, the P, the 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 uh, the rate of learning. So how 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 large is the decrease depends on how low the P is. And I won't I won't show you the equation, but it's it's not very difficult. It's not very complicated. But let's just point out that. If P is exactly zero, which means that the prey is highly unprofitable, then learning will be complete in one single interaction. One interaction is required to bring P from 0.5 to zero. And the higher the P, the closer the P is to zero to 0.5, uh, the more uh, interactions it's, it's going to take. Okay. So again, I didn't develop this this uh, this this learning model. It's developed by you know a bunch of uh, well mainly just Michael Spee right here uh, in a series of papers he published in in, in the 90s. Okay, so if I so the model is this. So you know it um, the model cons, you know, consists of say 50,000 time steps, and in you can you can imagine that as as days. So in every day, there's a you know some predators existing there in a model. It's, it's going to encounter two types of prey that are both toxic, and it's want to learn. Uh, it's going to learn to avoid. And the scenario here is that one of the prey is the local one, so it's the more it's the more common one. So in the in the in the model, there are two hundred of them, and the second type of prey is also toxic. And it's also warning color, which means that it has bright colors, but it's much, much more rare. In this case, it only has one tenth of the abundance of the of this local prey. You can think of this as you know the prey too is migrating from somewhere else into the ter into the region where prey one already exists. And each of them, you know, has a. Uh, Throughout interactions, the bird would learn to avoid each each one of them following the, the learning principle, the rules that I show you in the previous slide. Okay, so this just goes on for 50,000 days. And every 100 days, there's going to be prey reproduction described by this very simple population growth equation. This simply is a population growth when there's a carrying capacity. So, you know, the public will just grow and then as closer it gets from the current capacity, it's going gonna, it's gonna to slow down. So there's going to be a sigmoid shape population growth that you see in like ecology textbooks. Okay, so here is, uh, you know, I show you a few simulation, a few possible outcomes. So the, the blue curves, uh, oh, sorry, the blue curves, they show you uh, where at the end of the, the simulation, both prey species, they survive. None, neither of them goes extinct. So those are the blue curves. And the red curves means that the common, the more common ones survive, but the rarer one go extinct. And the black curve means that both prey go extinct. Okay, so these are the, these three are the three possible outcomes from this predator prey interaction learning scenario. I'll use the same color coding uh, for the results I'm going to show you right now. Okay, so we are looking, what we care about is, uh, you know, because we care about how peer learning can explain, uh, you know, when you single diversity. So the two parameters in our model is the P, which is the, uh, the final attack probability towards, you know, um, both prey. So the lower the, the, the P means that the prey is highly unprofitable. You can imagine it's highly toxic or just really hard to capture. 
And 0.5 means that the prey is basically not toxic at all. So it's, it's a neutral prey. Okay, and the F is the forgetting rate, which means that how much, how much a predator would forget about this learned connection in the absence of prey interactions. Okay, so the parameter space we're looking at is from zero to, to 0 0.5. And the reason for the P to be, the highest value to be 0.5 is because like I said, you know, we are talking about avoidance. Avoidance means that the P is below, you know, it's below random, below 0 0.5. And the F, the highest values for F is 0.5 is because like I said, the most forgetful a predator can be is that if it just forgets all the learned avoidance from zero and all the way to go from zero to 0 0.5 in one single time step uh, when it doesn't encounter the prey. That's the most forgetful a predator can be. So this 0 0.5 by 0 0.5 square is the perimeter space we're looking at. So the results would look something like this. Okay, you can see uh, the red regions are the ones where at the end of the simulations, and by the way, each square is the average of 10 replica simulations. So the blue regions means that at the end of simulation, after 50,000 steps, both prey, one is 10 times more abundant than the other one, they both survive. Neither of them goes extinct. And the red region means that only the common one uh, survive and the rare one goes go extinct. And if you see like the somewhere like dark red or black, that means that both prey, they're gone. They're eaten uh, all by the predators. So you can, we can visually divide this, uh, this outcome into three regions. So here would means warning signal diversity because at the end of the day, uh, both prey that bear different signals, they both exist, they both survive the whole you know, predation event. And the red region means that we're seeing homogeneity. And this is predicted by the theory, uh, like I mentioned before, the more common ones survive and, and, and the rare one go extinct. And this is the th what the theory uh, had, pre had predicted in the first place. Okay. And I wanna point out that these two numbers, the attack probability and forgetting rate, you can actually measure them. You can empirically measure them using learning experiments, so which means that you know this framework, it doesn't exist in a theoretical vacuum. You can actually take this, you go out there, you pick your, uh, if you have a, say a bird that you think are the main predators that might maintain when it's diversity in your community, you can actually go out, do experiments and measure uh, the P toward the prey and how forgetful uh, this bird is, for example, and actually look at where they are on this graph. And that would tell you how likely it is that this predator is maintaining the warning signal diversity that you're seeing in your community. Okay, so, but uh, the P, you can just, you know, whatever you get, you measure, you can just directly plug into the model. But the forgetting rate is a little tricky because in the model, in the model, each time step is not real time. It's not human time units. It's actually, you know, a hundredth of the prey generation time, which means that when you measure a real, like, you know, you, you experiments to measure the real forgetting rate, it's in human units, you know, maybe, you know, uh, how, how much they forget per day, per week, per month, you, you name it. So, to actually plug into the data you, you collect, you have to convert the learning rate, learn, uh, the forgetting rate uh, to what's suitable in the model. And the, the way to do that is, well, you, you gotta know the, the prey generation time. So in this case, if you have a prey whose generation time is 30 days, so each time step equals to 0.3 days in the model. So a forgetting rate of a real life, forgetting rate of say, 0.1 per day will equal to this much in the model. So you need to like convert a little bit, but you can, whatever you measure, you can just plug into the model and this will allow you to, to sort of assess the potential of your predator um, or, well, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it later, but a predator uh, is potential in maintaining one single diversity in your community. 
So I'll give you, I'll just give this, I'll give you example. So this is uh, in the results from uh, the, the simulation. And this represents the, the worst and the best case scenarios of the model. So this relates to uh, you know, how quickly prey can replenish is themselves under predation. Because this value is really hard to measure in real life. So we use that to bracket. So this is that, well, if the prey can replenish itself that fast, so this is the worst case scenario. And this is the best case scenario. So I take uh, you know, six uh, pre-learning data from literature. So the first one is a shrew, it's a mammal. The second is a spider. So when the third and the fifth is a bird, they are you know, uh, blue tits and domestic chick, a lizard and a fish. Uh, people have measured the, uh, you know, the final P of this predator towards their prey in the experiment and also how forgetful these predators are. And I can just map them onto the, the model and would tell you, for example, you know, one and two, they have really high potential of maintaining warning signal diversity if they were the main predators in their community. On the contrary, something like, you know, in this fish in particular, it's really, really forgetful. It forgets, learn avoid very quickly. So it's very, it's more unlikely that this fish or something with a similar learning ability is going to maintain multiple warning signals in the same community. So this is how you can sort of, you know, apply, use this framework and plug in, to, plug in real learning data. And that would give you an idea about, you know, how likely uh, warning signal diversity is maintained by predator learning in any community of your interest, of your choice. Okay, so basically, let me just summarize. Um, so I show that Mueller's idea, you know, of predator learning can actually allow for warning signal diversity. You know, I, I think the authors, the, these two authors, they, uh, I think they got it wrong. They, they, they were mistaken. So basically, uh, that can happen if, A, the final attack probably is low. So if the prey is more unprofitable, then it's more likely that this can happen. Also, if prey can maintain, uh, can retain this learned avoidance for a long time, meaning that they're forgetting rates low. So they would, this will bring you to this pocket in my model. Um, then if these two things are true, then it's more likely that uh, prey learning can allow for multiple warning signals to exist in the same habitat. And more importantly, empirical learning data can be incorporated into the model. So again, this framework has a connection uh, to, uh, to the reality. Okay, so um, I won't have time to go into the literature meta-analysis in detail, but uh, I'm just gonna uh, sort of uh, talk about it briefly. So like I said, you know, as I was you know, doing this project, I, had to, I, I read a lot of the papers that quantify predator learning, and I wanted to see if I could get something out of those papers. So, you know, here is the sort of just show you how I select the papers and, you know, the, the, the what I measure and you just read it. I won't, I won't, I just won't go over, I, I, I won't just go over and repeat them again. But at the end, I, I, uh, I, I picked, there are uh, 112 papers where I, where I can get um, the information I needed and, and, and also to satisfy some, some criteria of selection. So uh, the, the results I'm going to talk about are based on these 112 papers. Okay, so uh, the main idea here is that what determines final attack probability towards prey? So then circle back to the P, the final P value. So as I told you before, you know, you might be under the impression that this has to do only with, you know, how, say how toxic or how, you know, how uh, distasteful the prey is, but there's actually more than that. So, else being equal. So I want to see, does it matter if the prey are presented sequentially or simultaneously? So in experiments, some of them, they present, you know, uh, unprofitable prey and a normal prey one at a time, sequentially. In some other experiments, they present them at the same time to the predator. And what I found is that uh, when unprofitable prey uh, were presented along with control with normal prey, a prey that are not, 
you know, has nothing bad about them, then all else being equal, those prey were attacked less often. Also, what's making this prey unprofitable, whether it's toxicity, uh, you know, uh, whether it's bad taste or whatever, it doesn't matter as much uh, if, if those prey were present along with normal prey. So this has important, uh, you know, real life implications, even though I'm describing uh, differences in sort of, you know, lab experiment design, because you can imagine uh, if for sit and wait predator, so who just sits there and, and just eats whatever comes, you know, in front of his eyes, it's more likely that the prey that he encounters would show up sequentially. Whereas, you know, if a, prey, if a predator that just goes around, uh, you know, move around very much, and it's more likely that it, it, it might see a lot of prey, you know, maybe not simultaneously, but, you know, within a short amount of time. So this means that the, 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 the predation style, the foreign style of the prey is gonna matter as to, uh, as to uh, 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 the attack probability uh, toward its, its, its prey, that matters. So how a predator forages matters too. Also, I want to, I want to see if a certain type of uh, condition stimuli will be more effective than ours. So this means that you know, uh, if, if the warning signal is color or pattern or color plus pattern or color plus something, some other visual signal, would, there, would some type of signals be more effective uh, in, uh, you know, in, uh, for people to learn than others? So from the papers, I found that color was the most effective signal. And adding other elements, maybe a little surprisingly, actually make learning uh, less efficient. And also, does the type of, you know, the reason, the reason uh, does the reason why a prey is unpopular matter? So toxicity versus, say, just bad taste, does it matter? Well. Toxicity, toxin was still the most effective stimulus, but simply being unpalatable, so simply being taste, simply taste bad was also effective too. Okay, so I wanna circle back, uh, this is my last slide, but I wanna circle back to this. So all I've been talking about is modeling, simulation, or you know, analysis from literature, but what I'm doing right now here in Taiwan is actually doing field learning experiments. So the way to do this, I just print out, uh, you know, in, 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 in certain time we have, we have uh, two groups of butterflies that, you know, the left three possess the same type of warning signal. They're, they're, they're mimics, they're, they mimic one another. And the, the three on the right, they're all, they're all toxic and they coexist. There's no, as far as I can tell, as far as anybody can tell, there's no obvious temporal or to a spatial segregation. But these two type of, of warning signals coexist in the same community. And what I want to do in the near future is I want to conduct using you know, print out fake butterfly to do field learning experiments to quantify the P and F that I mentioned in my model to evaluate how likely it is that predator learning is maintaining the coexistence of these two types of butterflies in the community. And this is where I think there's a great potential for collaboration in Indonesia because I haven't looked into the butterfly fauna in Indonesia, but I'll be surprised. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if you have the same system there. So if you go into a community in a, in a rainforest or, or somewhere, I bet you'll find uh, multiple groups of butterflies or you know something, uh, some insect or something that possess distinctive warning signals that coexist stably in a community. So maybe there's a chance for, for, for us to collaborate and for, you know, for me to go over there and, and, and uh, you know, and, and together we can do this field experiment in your community. And that's gonna provide another, maybe another test using a different system and different location to really provide more evidence uh, for predator learning as a resolution, potential resolution for this paradox of warning signal diversity. So that's my hope. And that's you know, where I hope uh, more, uh, some fruitful collaboration can happen. So 
um, with that, that's all I have to share today. And thank you for listening and I'll be happy to take any question you might have. Questions, anybody? Yeah, thank, thank you very much, Prof. Ko. Thank you very much for the fascinating and interesting topic that you share with us. It's about the predator learning and actually how the animals then uh, learn to avoiding the prey and uh, capturing the information and processing and then they are recognizing in, in the future. And uh, also the uh, avoiding learning is used by the animals to, to recognizing the poisons or venomous or dangerous prey. Uh, if I'm not get wrong what you say actually. No, it's correct. It's totally correct. Yes. And uh, yeah, this is a very interesting topic. I mean, like not only about the adaptiveness of the animals, but also uh, evolutionary biology. And for those of you, the audience have a questions, please type in or you can uh, unmute your uh, microphone and asking directly to the prof. Well, I have a question. Actually, for the audience, not to Dr. Guo. <laughs> are there any audience in, in the meeting right now who are working on butterflies? Any butterfly researchers here? Or anybody that knows somebody who works on butterflies? <laughs> <laughs> that works too. Yeah, actually, in our department, there is one professor working on butterfly, Professor Dahelmi. Uh, but I'm not sure he is in here right now. Okay, well, or, you know, not even just butterflies, because a lot of, you know, warning signal, I just use butterflies as an example because I, I study butterflies. But, you know, frogs or, you know, weevils, there's a lot of different things that has, you know, warning signal is very pervasive. So a lot of different taxa has that, have that. Um, so, you know, anything that you, you, you might think of, uh, you know, not restricted, just insects, but anything, if you have any sort of knowledge about something that's um, has bright colors and, and potentially toxic or just tastes bad or sprays anything noxious, that would, that would work potentially. It doesn't have to be butterflies at all. Yeah. Yeah, audience, anybody that are working right now on butterflies, uh, Prof. Kuo and Prof. Su asking about these questions. If you're working on this topic or on this uh, subject animal, please let us know, or maybe you have uh, questions, please uh, uh, type in, in the, the comments, and or you can also unmute your uh, microphone and ask directly to Prof. Kuo. Question, please. Hello, Ihan. Uh, yes, Farizali. Yeah, sorry, I couldn't open my video yet. Oh, yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor T. Yuko. Yeah, very interesting topic. This is something that I think your presentation is mostly about the, uh, from the perspective of learning by the predator. So how about the from perspective of a, a prey? Is there any learning, some kind of theory from your uh, viewpoint, please. Oh, you mean prey, learning by the prey? Yes. Uh, yeah, so I mean, prey can learn for sure. Um, I guess, so I, you know, that's not, I didn't consider that at all in the model. And it's not because it's not important. It's because in this context, it's mostly about you know, in, in this I, in this sort of predator prey interactions, prey, prey are the ones to that really dominates who gets eaten, who get, who doesn't get eaten, right? So there's not a lot of potential to for butterfly to to um to really exert its power to escape predation. So if if a bird wants to eat a butterfly, it's probably going to be eaten. <laughs> and so I think that is why in in this particular context. Um, there is probably not a lot of room for prey to learn about uh, maybe avoiding predators. So, you know, in, in more, in, in more, say, if we talk about uh, maybe more um, behaviorally complex systems, for example, mammals, for example, 
there might potential for, pre to, for prey to learn to do something to reduce the predation risk. And that would be very interesting if that, if that um, uh, is happening at the same time as the warning signals. Um, I'm not aware of anything that's that, 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 I mean, nothing comes to mind right away, but that might just mean that I, you know, I haven't read about these things. So if you know about any, if anybody or Professor Rizaldi, if you know about anything that's potentially you have warning signal and prey learning, you know, interacting at the same time, I'll, 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 I'll be happy just to, to, to learn more about that because that'll be fascinating. Yeah. Sure. Uh, if the prey has uh, some capacity for learning, yeah, mostly like uh, vertebrates, yeah, vertebrate prey. So probably, yeah, just like rats and, and rodents, yeah, probably they can have uh, some uh, capacity of learning and they may have uh, some strategy so uh, how to avoid the, the, the predator, right? And yeah. then I just want to comment about the, the uh, are you talking mostly about the color pattern or do you also consider about the pattern or shape or something? Uh, the pattern? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so so basically, um, so color just means that it just, you know, if a butterfly is just all red or, or yellow or so, anything like just color differences. Pattern means the distribution of the colors. Yep. So if you have say, you know, for example, like, you know, one stripe versus two stripes or a vertical stripe versus a horizontal stripe, that kind of thing. And, and people have manipulated this in, in, in lab learning experiments quite a bit. So they would say, for example, they produce a, a prey that's, you know, maybe yellow background with stripes, black stripes, and that's one signal. And the other design would be a yellow background with black dots. And that would be a, a, a pattern difference, but the color is the same. It's all, it, they're both yellow and black. Um, so, my results show that if you change color and the pattern at the same time, it's actually going to make learning less efficient. Okay. Yeah, which is kind of surprising because you know you might think that okay, well, if you if you combine now, you know the the information is not just color but pattern. It's going to make the signal more specific, right? You're gonna not just color but also the pattern. But it's the, actually the result is the opposite. So maybe that just means that. Okay, the predator now has to memorize, uh, you know, to recognize the color and the pattern. So for us, that that you know is not a problem because we are, you know, we we have this capacity. But maybe for uh, some other predators, it's just too much to 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 uh, maybe their um, you know uh, perception or their uh, cognitive system is not is not that capable. Uh, but the results are from birds, so. I, I can't I can't I can generalize this the same result to other predators, but for birds, that's what I saw from the literature. Okay. So what do you think about the naive predator? Naive predator. That yeah. just means that it has no experience to the for the, uh, to the prey. Yeah. So so uh, if you if you give a, a bird something that is never seen before, ever. So it has no information about well what this means, right? So it might see a pattern, but this pattern doesn't, you know, he has never seen it in his life before, so it doesn't know what this pattern uh, is associated with, right? So at that point, it's naive, and and it would just attack the prey. As, you know, it's like a roll of dice, or flip a coin, right? Like you, you know, if it's like head, you eat it. If it's tail, you don't eat it. That's naive. That's what naive means. It means no prior yeah. knowledge about something yeah yeah but if we learn from the evolutionary history that uh, some vertebrate they may have some evolutionary uh uh print in in their uh, gene that they have to avoid a particular individual with the particular color uh, a color aposematic color or maybe pattern or shape or something just like a human mm. uh, or some primates some for example they will try to uh, avoid the particular shape just like a snake, right? Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yes. That's a great point. So uh, the, the term is called neophobia or certain phobia. And, and yes, for example, some birds, they, uh, uh, people have done this in tropical birds, but I think it is actually very common. Uh, naive birds, 
a bird that you know raised by humans that has never seen a coral snake before. Coral snake is a toxic snake that has a, a red and you know, red, black, yellow sort of alternating patterns. So, so the 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 biologist they, they raised the, this bird, you know, in a lab who has never seen a coral snake before, but it would instinctively learn to uh, no, instinctively avoid anything that looked like that. Yeah. And and you can yeah you can sort of theorize that to say okay well maybe because it's like you said you know that is a dangerous prey in their natural habitat so somehow that pattern got gets uh, the learn avoidance gets imprinted into their uh, genes or system or you know we don't know the mechanism but yes they would just instinctively avoid something that looked like that and and the same thing goes on neophobia so. A lot of animals they would they would avoid anything that they have they have never seen before, um, but but the funny thing is neophobia can be overcome. So if you so the learning experiment that people do, the first step they need to do is not really to do experiment is to train the birds or whatever to to actually start eating the the, the experimental prey, uh, which tend to be something that the bird or something has never seen before. You know, like like a like a ball or something that that that's that's new to the birds. So they have to spend like a few days to tra to train the birds that this is okay to eat, okay. and the neophobia, which does exist, can be overcome if the prey is actually not there's nothing bad about it. But you're very right. It's a great point. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Professor uh, Chiyoko. Yeah. Thank you uh, okay, question. probably the last question you have. Is it okay you have? Sure, sure, sure. So yeah, I just course. want to know, is it a particular taxa that you are looking for to prove the paradox uh, uh, theory? Uh, especially in, in Indonesia uh, or in tropical region. And do you have any particular taxa that you are looking for? I don't. Uh, as long as it's, it's, uh, it's tractable. So, so for example, I can do this in, you know, uh, I point out skunks, right? They have like warning, uh, warning signals, but it'd be very difficult if I use, if I do experiment, learning experiments using yes. skunk as the prey, is the prey, right? Yes. That would be a little difficult. So I think something, I think insects or invertebrates uh, might be more suitable, but it, again, it doesn't have to be butterflies or even insects, as long as that's something that's easy because I need to use, I need to create artificial prey that look like the real ones. So um, something, if I can do that easily, that would, that would work. Okay, I think for sure you can find it in, in our place. Just, yeah, please come. I, I, I would love to, I would yeah. love to. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Again, thank you, uh, Prof. Yunkyo. Yeah, Iham, thank you, Iham. Thank you, Prof. Rizadi. And uh, any question, any other question from the other audience, please? So yeah, if no more questions, uh, we will move to the second keynote speaker, Dr. Uh, Professor Dr. Dewi Imelda Rosma. And Prof. Ko, thank you very much for your uh, PowerPoint and information that you share with us. And uh, I think there is no more question from the audience. And we will move to the second speaker. Hello, Prof. Kuo. Hi. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds great. Well, thank you, Ham, for hosting, and thank thanks for everybody who uh, you know who tune in to, to listen. Thanks. All right, All right Prof. I wish you still here, right? Yeah. I'm, well, so I I might have to leave some uh, in the uh, around one p.m. So after this talk, the second talk, right. I might have to. Because I'm traveling to Kaohsiung actually today. Okay. Um. Yeah, but I'll, I'll stay for another hour or so. Okay. Thank you, Prof. Bo. Thank you for the interesting topic that you share with us. And now okay. uh, we move to the second speaker, and will be presented by Professor Dr. Dewi Imelda Rosma. Uh, he's working a lot uh, with uh, freshwater fish from the ecological aspect and uh, conservation and uh, genomic aspect. And uh, Prof. Uh, Dewi is here with us right now. And time and place, I will give in to Prof. Dewi to uh, share and uh, sharing uh, his res research on the freshwater fish. Prof. Devi, please, is your time. Okay, thank you. Uh, but first of all, the, the, the uh, MC said the, I'm the, the third. 
The second is uh, Professor Huang. How about that? Is yes, it okay? Well, yeah. Hello, Prof. Yeah. Yeah. Who well, see me said that the 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 second uh, speaker is uh, Professor Huang. Isn't it? Actually, we yeah. he revised the the schedule, and uh, I'm not because I sent last time to the Dr. Wilson of Marino. So okay. I think the second one is your turn, actually, bro. Okay. okay. Can uh, you have a time right now? Okay. Thank you. Okay. May Thank I share you, my slide? Thank you, bro. Uh, good afternoon for everybody, for everyone, especially for our uh, speakers, for Professor Ku with a nice presentation, um, Professor Su and Professor Wang in the next. Uh, let I, let I uh, present my research is about the first water phase phylogeography on the uniqueness of the waters on Sumatra. Okay, okay. Uh, actually, my I'm talking about this uh, to to introduce how important uh, Sumatran Island to be visited, especially for biodiversity study. <laughs> Let I introduce our uh, lab uh, person. This is our uh, our humble dean. This is me, and this is Professor Dr. Mansurian, uh, especially in plant genetic, and Dr. Safula in um, seawater fish genetic population, especially in uh, Anguilla, Dr. Jong Hon Chong, uh, he, uh, he is uh, our hepatologist in also in genetic population. So uh, talking about the geography, Sumatra is very interesting. Because of, during my sense, uh, there are three ancient water flows to Malacca Strait and flows to the south of China and flows to the uh, Makassar Strait. And 12 million years ago, the um, subduction of the undersea plate would make uh, subduction. And now uh, we have uh, Bukit Barisan mountain range from the north to the south. And therefore the biodiversity actually in freshwater fish, what I'm talking about is influenced by the Malacca Street, by South China Sea, by Makassar Seas and also Indian uh, oceans. There are several mountains and thousands of uh, earthquakes that make um, the, the diversity is very, very, very uh, rich in our country. And also we have uh, Toba Lake as a barrier from north and to the, the, the south. Actually in Sumatra, we also have uh, four lakes, four big lakes, and about 230 rivers. This is about the background to start the study. When we collect the fees, long time ago, years ago, and most of uh, the students uh, I, I see we are here in the room and just and also Ilham and others and Mursid. So uh, we collect the fees 
and we identified by the geography, we said that uh, we saw that uh, 70 species only we found in West Sumatra and 26 species only in East Sumatra and 22 species we found in East and West. This is especially for native species and uh, separate. According to the lake, we have uh, 30 only found in um, Maninjau Lake and 70 in Singkara Lake, which is uh, four new species, new ident identified, um, and four for Danau di bawah and Danau di atas, uh, respectively. This is our milestones. So we, we said that isolation by Bukit Barisan mountain range lake and rivers in Sumatra plays a role in determining the diversity of the species in the western and the eastern parts of Bukit Barisan mountain range. And also we say that with uh, geographic isolation affect the diversity and genetic distance or Phylogenetic of cypronid fish found in lakes and rivers in West Sumatra. So the number of these species is only native species and the smallest uh, species. So we, we are studying for the uh, big uh, uh, fish, only the small fish. I'm sorry. And we choose uh, several species, uh, spirit, uh, three genus in this uh, moment. The first genus is Mystacolecus. Uh, there are only two species in Asia, in Indonesia. Mystacolecus padangensis, what we call it, really is endemic. The people said that in the endemic species and also uh, Mr. Colicus marginatus. Marginatus dispersed in every uh, island in Sumatra and also in China. When we studied the morphology, the difference between East and West Sumatra for about 47 characters. And when we studied the fish, for Padangensis in three lakes in Sumatra, we found that the difference of morphology is uh, 65 until 73 percent differences in morphology. But when we are studying in Morocco, we said that all of them, um, uh, although in rivers or in uh, lakes, there are the difference is only 0.001% more locally. So it said it's no, no reason to say that there are difference in species. So it's only in synonym from this species. Uh, we, uh, we are trying to study <coughs> the uh, why that it become very different in morphology. Maybe uh, we want to study to Professor Ku if uh, the, 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 the colors on, uh, also be uh, one of the, the, the reason. But until now we have the reason because uh, in the lake there are a predator for this uh, small fish. So only the fish with uh, dark, dark color and slimy is a survive. And uh, the, the Padang and Sisi live in a lake. When, when, they, uh, when they will meet, have a meet, meeting, they should go to the rivers. 
the need low temperature. So in the river, the need is two species. So the genetic exchange is always uh, done. And also we are studied to try to study what happened if uh, this species, which is a uh, stay in lake, when uh, fertilized, uh, their their uh, egg in lake, we found that in 30 degree they become triple white. So that's why maybe naturally they should go to the rivers to have a meat and therefore the genetic is still, genetic exchange is still happen and no differences in genetic. Although the difference in morphology clearly different morphological. This one genus. And, on, and also we study for other genus. We have uh, five A for Rasbora, genus of Rasbora. It's become a new species. Um, Rasbora lateristiata, Rasbora spiritania, Rasbora jacobsoni, and Rasbora sumatra. And for a long time, we almost everybody said that this is uh, the, in the lake of Manijau. The species is um, Rasbora lateristiata because it's very similar. Or they said that as a Rasbora sumatrana because it's in Sumatra. When we study morphologically, Rasbora Rasbora and uh, Rasbora uh, here in Maninjau is very similar to Rasbora Sumatrana, Mor morphologically. But when we study with uh, two gene, molecularly we use uh, CO1 and cytochrome B, we get the uh, Rasbora in Maninjau lake is very different. This is a sister taxa for Sumatrana and Spilotania. And uh, the ancestor is Ras Rasbora lateristiata. So if we see, if we look at the, these two genus, Mistacolecus and Rasbora, we get a paradox. <laughs> I, 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 I follow uh, the, 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 the clue. For the for the um, Rasbora, they're equal in morphology, but unequal unequal in molecularly. Vice versa, in Mastacolecus, they are unequal morphological, but equal in molecularly. So uh, two genus give. Uh, Figure out, figure out the two condition with the uh, vice versa. And others um, study other genus, which is uh, Puntius, is a study is, uh, done by Handika et al. This lake, we call it Danau Gunung Tuju. Is uh, 1,950 meters above sea level. So the highest lakes in Sumatra on, and maybe in Asia Tenggara, in, in South Asia. Uh, the, it's only 12 kilometers squares and maximum depth of 40 meters surrounded by Volcanic mountain with seven peak. So he thought it's um, Gunung Tuju. Tuju mean seven. Gunung Tuju, Gunung Mountain Tuju is uh, seven. There's no rivers around surrounding here. Uh, it's an inlet from the surrounding infiltration water and outlet only one. One uh, for outlet, 
is a waterfall with a height about 75 meters. And this fish we found in the depth of 20 to 30 meters. So, um, Hanika and friends and team caught by seeing of uh, fish traps. So we can say that this fish is isolation geographically, although that morphology is very similar and uh, almost no, no differences in morphology with other pundus. Other, <coughs> sorry, other uh, population is a surface fish. And in 1966, uh, Karina, one of the STEAM, our student, study with uh, phylogenetic using cytochrome B, the found that the fish from this lake is very different with other food use in um, Sumatra and also we, we get in other place. So we, uh, Karina, suppose that this is a new species, or at least is a, a subspecies. And then for the same um, genus, we did that um, there are synonym name for the Pontius, Barbonimus, Barbus, Barbores, Systomus, Caputa, and Hipsherbus. So we collect all the species of Pontius in Sumatra from the rivers and from the lake and from the NCBI data. So we studied using a two gene, CO1 gene and cytochrome gene. We get the answer. The cluster one is consists of Puntius, we say that CF, because he's the close uh, from for Benocatus, is spread from cluster two with a very different. So in other words, um, Puntius is not synonym. Puntius is not synonym. They are different from Barmonimus, Barbus, and others. And we see there are one, uh, one Puntius is Bansky in Malaysia. And the research of uh, the ichthyologist Kotelat is that this uh, identified that Puntius uh, Barbode Bansky in Malaysia is synonym name of uh, Barbodes Bansky. So from this study, we said that there is no Puntius in Sumatra. There are all Barbodes, and we are uh, the Barbodes, and also. Um, Puntius is not included in, is not a synonym name of this group. So our study correct the taxonomic status for this species. And interestingly, uh, population from the east, population from the west, and also population from the Manijau Lake, and also from Gunung Tuju, it differs in um, quite large genetic differences. So they have two subspecies, Barbodes Bansky from east, Barbodes Bansky from west, Barbodes Bansky Maninjau, and Barbodes Bansky Puntius Gunung Tuju. So at least we have a full. Uh, Subspecies for this bad bodies. This is not the uh, not the uh, cyprinid, but this is gobit. The people said that this is a um, gobit endemic for 
Sumatra, especially in Danau Maninjau and Singkara. But we found on also in Siais Lake and the North in Sumatra. We study morphological, histological, and also we use um, cytochrome B gene and CON gene. And this comparison is all the species from these four lakes are genetically same. So no difference between uh, the population for the three lakes. So we published in 19, uh, 2019. And last year, we found also, we found also in uh, Mentawai Island, in Mentawai Island, there's a part of, uh, a part of Sumatra about uh, 77,000 7, yeah, 7, uh, years ago, it's about that. And we try to study molecularly, they are all the same with the population from the lake. So um, I'm talking about the fish, but it like uh, it's just an uh, illustration that can be can uh, be studied in other taxa. Yeah, my fish state that big question for all taxa still left. Where, what, and how are the origin of species in Sumatra as a link to ancient river in the past, or as a link with the Bukit Barisan mountain range and other various? How the environmental factors affect the, the change and the expression of the genetic. So we invite uh, all the audience and especially our, our guests to study in Sumatra because Sumatra is interesting to study with the geography foundation. So my presentation and let me say my acknowledgments to Ministry of Indonesia and Ministry of Education of Singapore and also uh, Department Biodiversity and Reference Museum Bogor, uh, uh, Botany and Zoology and MUS to Andalas University to head of uh, department and be in the facultas, and especially for our students in genetic and biomolecular lab. Thank you, that's all for my presentation. Thank you. Yeah. Uh... Thank you, Prof. Devi, for your presentations and sharing the knowledge, uh, something about the phylogeography of freshwater fish around the Sumatra, especially from the genus from the genus of uh, Barbodes. And uh, uh, this is very interesting study. I mean, like uh, genetic analysis, not only for uh, to understand the evolutionary history of a species, uh, but also for distinguish uh, whether one species belonging to other or they are separated to be one species. Uh, this is information is really important for uh, evaluating the population's status of a species. Suppose uh, before we count one species one group then after genetic analysis we know there are kind of different spaces and mostly uh, after the genetic analysis uh, we can separate it one species to other and our population is sometimes uh, reduced reducing by a large number of points and uh, yeah some species uh, they are uh, belonging to critical and there are some still vulnerable and uh, uh, for student or audience have a question to Prof. Devi. 
are related to the genetic analysis or uh, freshwater, freshwater feeds ecology or diversity in West Sumatra. And you can type in, in the comments or you can unmute your audio and uh, asking directly to the Prof. Dewi. Any question, please? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I'm, I do have several questions. All right, Prof. Yeah, please, Prof. Hello, uh, uh, Professor. Yes. Yes, I'm um, Is that proper uh, way to call you, Professor Dewey or Professor? Just yes, call me Dewey. De okay, Professor okay. Dewey. Uh, my question is to you, because you mentioned several lakes in Sumatra. Yeah. Right. Uh, have you encountered any cases, uh, just like the African chili fish, they radiate within a lake? instead of uh, subdivided by the river systems in Sumatra? Um, yes, yes, uh, from, uh, uh, but not, uh, not uh, intensively because there are so many species we have to, to, uh, to make a study systematically. So uh, mm -hmm. if we say we if we look for the this um, this uh, lake, this is the isolated geographical uh, isolated no water inlet. So the waters is come from around. Uh, it's different with the these three lakes. These three lakes is the uh, eastern. Okay, this is eastern. There are several waters comes by by rivers. So um, this um, we predict this uh, species in like a raspberry in in this uh, lake is come from uh, so, uh, is, uh, southeast south east uh, yeah, south China from oh. south China there are a long time ago. Mm -hmm. for, uh, for maybe for 75,000 years ago. Yeah, from phylogenetic study, we can uh, see the, the evolutionary and the time and uh, dispersal. Okay, so, so you consider the river system will be the cause of the diversity of this fish, right? Yeah. Okay, great. So uh, my next question is, uh, since you are doing a lot of molecular work, so have you considered any other methods other than just one, two, one or two genes? Have you considered any genomic methods to collect more genetic markers from, from those populations? Yeah, I just did the uh, two genes because the uh, data in the IUCN uh, only this, uh, does uh, two genes. So I uh, have to use uh, all the species that I have uh, study with the same genes because I have to compare it each other. So okay. I'm looking for uh, uh, the gene bank. Okay, yeah. great. So. Uh... I saw that you are affiliates or you are collaborate with NUS, right? NUS, yes. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, I think they might have some facility that you can get a bigger data from the fish genomes. Yeah. Can. Uh, can I can I know who that you are collaborating with in NUS? Because I I worked there for a while. Oh yes, uh, with uh, Tan Hui. Oh, okay. I'm happy and um, uh, me, uh, I'm, bothered in, I'm working in uh, SODIC laboratory. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Tan because I... in Tan Hon Hui in uh, LMDZ and also Peter, Peter, but Peter with the crabs. Okay. Because I, I do work a lot on, on biogeography. So if you ever need any help on the data collection or the data analysis, 
please let me know. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. It was great to hear. Thank you. All right, I have no further questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Su. Yeah, thank you, Prof. Su, uh, for the questions. And uh, any question from the other audience? Related to the pilogography of freshwater fish. Is there no question? All right. Yes, Prof. Devi, I think there is no more questions. Uh, audience want to ask you for further information. Thank you. Uh, all right. So if there is no questions, we will take a break. For for about one and half hour, for about half hour to getting lunch and prepare yourself for maybe drink a coffee. Then we'll continue this seminar at 11.30 Indonesia time. But I guess right now in Taiwan's maybe, yeah, uh, 11.42, uh, I guess. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, for the audience, uh, I think if there is no more questions for to from Dewi, we will take a break for, for 45 minutes and we will continue this seminar at 11, uh, 1130 uh, Indonesian time. And I, I wish you will still here because at the end of this seminar, Prof. Su and Prof. Po and Prof. Wang, we will share information about the uh, collaborations, scholarships, and maybe financial funding or support for our research in Indonesia. And I wish you will stay, you will be stay here and uh, following this seminar until at the end of the event. Thank you very much. I see you later soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Yaham, and, Thank you. and also the opportunity. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, see you later. See you in half hour, 45 minutes, sorry.
camino
Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to our seminar. Because it's already 11 past 30, we continue to the next session, ya, yeah? Ilham? Yep. Okay, we continue to the second session. Uh, this uh, session will be moderated by Dr. Rizaldi. Before we continue, I maybe I call for Dr. Rizaldi. Dr. Rizaldi, are you with us? Yep. Can you hear okay. me? Okay, thank you, Dr. Rizaldi. Okay. And uh, for the, all the particip participants, hopefully you still be on fire to this seminar because maybe some of you have a lunch and break, uh, coffee break, maybe. And directly, uh, I give a time and screen to Dr. Rizaldi. Dr. Rizaldi, please welcome. Okay, thank you, Busumi. Uh, welcome back, everyone, to the seminar. So we will continue to the second session. So for the second session, we will have uh, two speakers. And the first one is uh, Professor Su, Dr. Su Yong Chao. Yeah. Hello, Professor Su. So he's a professor at the School of Life Science, Department of Biomedical Science and Environment Biology. Is that correct, Professor Su? And at the Kaohsiung Medical University. Okay. All right. And he's also a director at the International Student Office at the KMU. Okay. And today he's going to talk about the application of phylogenomic and population genomic tools to biogeography and ecologic, ecological adaptation cases of arachnid and uh, insect. Arachnid uh, the spider, right? Okay, so. <laughs> okay, yeah. And the second uh, speakers was uh, Dr. Huang, and Dr. Huang is Hello. here. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, so I yeah. will give the chance first to the Professor Su, and yeah, please, Professor Su, to present your talk. <laughs> Time is yours, please. Thank you, Dr. Rizali, for the nice introduction. Uh, now I'm going to share my screen. Uh, let me know if you can see the slides on the screen. Yep, you can see clearly. All right, great. great. So today I'm going to just uh, give everybody a very brief introduction of just one case. But uh, it is uh, like a newer method to collect several thousands of genes for uh, geographic and population genomic works. So uh, after this case, I will briefly show you several results from different genomic methods that is suitable for population level or even uh, microbiology level. So uh, that will be just uh, uh, showing you several pictures. But the first case will be completely just focused on one group of spider and the talking about the details of the methods of how I get those uh, genes several thousand genes from those genomes. All right, so let's move on to the next slide. So the outline of this talk will include the first one, how I initiated this study about the segmented trapdoor spiders and a, a, a little bit brief introduction of what kind of spider that is and the, why they are so interesting. And then the, Third part will be introducing the genomic method that I'm using. This is, this is a type of target sequencing methods. We call it ultra conserved elements, target sequencing methods, or in brief, I call it UCE methods. And then using these several thousands of genes, I will tell you how this data resolved the evolution of the segmented uh, trapdoor spiders. And lastly, I will talk about the current and the future applications of these genomic methods. All right, so this is going to be, going to be a very brief introduction, but uh, I hope you enjoy it. The first one is how I get started. The first one is uh, in about 20 years ago, I conducted a lot of uh, geographic and phylogenetic studies. The problem is I always only use several genes and the genetic markers 
Well, sometimes they are very highly, highly applicable or they, they have high resolution, but a lot of time they fail to resolve the genetic relationships among the target taxa. So that's why I, I'm, I'm trying to find out if there are any other methods that I can collect more data from each genome. So we end up with doing these segmented spider projects. And it, this project involved actually 12 authors from 10 countries. And it lasts for almost like five day, uh, five years. So what's the, what's the fundamental problem of using small, small number of genetic markers? Here are two, uh, two papers published in Journal of Biogeography in 2016, side by side, next to each other. And we actually are trying to answer the, the biogeography of one, uh, one kind of spiders that, that is ground dwelling. They, they live in the burrows on the, on the ground and they never disperse. So we thought that is a very nice about geographic markers or indicators to kind of tell or study the, the geographic events in that area of Ryukyu and Taiwan. But we, in both studies, we only use two to five, uh, three to five genetic markers. And then these two, this, when this two manuscript was under review, it was actually challenged by a lot of reviewers because of the resolution of these, uh, these, these genetic markers. So the story is quite simple. Here is Taiwan, and uh, there, are, there is an island chain along, along this line from, from the south to the north is Yayama Islands and the Amami Islands. And uh, uh, geographically, we know they, they were isolated in the, in the past time during the ge uh, geological history. However, uh, the diversity matched on these geographic areas is a little bit uh, uncertain in a, lot, in, a, in, in a lot of times. And uh, a lot of uh, papers supported the within 5 million years hypothesis. However, in both of the studies I mentioned, we all indicate that's older than at least 10 million years old. So, but we only have several of the genetic markers. Like for, for instance, my own manuscript, is, we use only three genetic markers and the, by Xu et al, they use five genetic markers. But we are trying to test a very, uh, at that time consider very young island chain. And then we, we actually end up with a very concrete result. So, well, these two papers almost got rejected. Interesting, but because we both submit submitted these two manuscripts to the same journal at the same time. We, we didn't know each other actually during that time, but we actually just submit that papers to, to, this, uh, to this journal. And then they, the reviewer and editor saw this and then they figure, figure well, this is, cannot be just an accident because they both come up with a very similar conclusion, but it's conflict with the current uh, uh, understanding of this island chain. So what do we do? So me is here and the she is over here. And uh, there are some Japanese and uh, Singapore uh, researchers from Singapore and uh, Europe. They all get involved into this project. And uh, we try to come up with, we try to brainstorming and try to come up with uh, newer methods for this. And uh, we end up with publishing this work in systematic biology. And uh, me and the Xu Xing contribute equally to this work. So it's very exciting for me because finally, we actually found out the very uh, useful techniques to answer the very, very old ancient tex taxon. So we end up with collected 2007, uh, almost like 3000 genetic markers from almost 200 tips or 200 samples. And uh, there are a lot of authors involved in this work. So what are the segmented spiders? We call it living fossils in spiders because they are almost like the tab recorders of any geological event. Later you will understand this. So in the uh, spider taxonomy, there are three big groups over here. The first one is actually 
the segmented spiders, which is the sister group to other spiders that you know right now. And the, within this big crate, there are two lineages. One is Megalomorphis. Uh, uh, if you know, if you know Venturas, they are in this big crate. And uh, there is another one that is commonly seen, like all weavers and other, other spiders are in, in this crate. So we know the lineage of segmented spiders is really, really old. And uh, we know it's closely, closely related to an extinct lineage over here. But when we use just a few of the genetic markers, we lost the resolution because this is an ancient, uh, ancient crate. So we end up with testing all the methods. This is one kind of method. We call it a restriction site uh, DNA sequencing. Uh, restriction site associated DNA sequencing, or we just call it RASIC in brief. So, so when you see the number of the genetic markers and then correlate that with the age of this lineage, this is younger lineages. This is very uh, like mid, mid, middle old lineage, and this is really old lineages. You can see the number of genetic markers start from 3,900 and drop down to 100 something. And we actually allowed a lot of uh, missing data in these data metrics. So that means when your, your study or your target lineage is, is really, really ancient, any kinds of uh, genetic markers cannot allow you to get this resolution to answer your either phylogenetic problems or biogeographic problems. All right, so this group is actually dated back to, in average, somewhere around 200 million years old. All right, so now we, we, we are stuck. We don't have any, in, enough genetic markers. So we start looking into the literatures. And luckily, when I was still in America, we actually learned how to use ultra conserved element target sequencing methods. It's one kind of reduced representation genomic sequencing methods, which means you only extract or you only sequence part of the genome from each sample, not all of the genomes. So it's different from whole genome sequencing. So we target just several thousand fragments and then we capture them and then put them in the solution and then sequence them. And then in, in some bioinformatic pipelines, we can actually separate them into different samples. So here's a very a uh, brief introduction of those uh, reduced representation sequencing methods. Of course, one whole genome, whole genome sequencing is one of them. And the empiricon or metagenomics is one of them. And uh, as I mentioned, restriction sites associated DNA sequencing or RASIC is one of them. Target sequencing and uh, naturally the RNA sequencing is one kind of uh, reduced representation sequencing methods. For UCEs, this is, uh, these are the uh, very conserved elements or sequences in all the genomes of all kinds of organisms. When you align the genomes of, of several uh, very closely related genomes together, you will find out there are some parts of the genomes. It is 100% conserved. So using these, using these UCEs, we actually can develop something we call it baits or probes to capture the targeted genes within the genomes. So I just, I just kind of doing some very uh, brief introduction. For instance, you have different spiders and now you have uh, different assemblies of genomes. Then you align those genomes together and then you go for uh, hunting for the UC fragments and then you develop probes from that to capture the targeted genes. So it's just like this, I right? just kind of show you several uh, uh, slides to kind of introduce these kind of techniques. So first you align the genomes together and then find out the 100% conserved uh, fragments or genetic, genetic sequences. And then you extract those, those sequences to, to put them as the probe candidates. And then you map those uh, captured probes to other genomes to see if they are still exist in other, in other genomes like this. And then you, if you found them, that means these kind of 
uh, sequences uh, conserved across different uh, taxa, then you uh, expand that a little bit to actually synthesize those DNA fragments as your probes to capture the, the genomic fragments. So when you synthesize those uh, probes, you put them in the solution with the fragmented DNA of your samples. And then you label them, label the probes, and you can capture the genomic fragments from your samples like this. So when that, when that was put in the solution, you can use the magnetic bees to capture them and wash off the unwanted genetic fragments from the solution, and then sequence those captured sequences. Then that will be your several thousands of genes that you can use for phylogenomics or uh, biogeography. So what's the result of this project? Uh, the result is actually very simple and very straightforward. So we collected segmented trapdoor spiders from all these areas that shaded in colors. So we collected 185 of uh, uh, trapdoor spider samples, including one spot in Sumatra near Andalus University. I don't know if you, some of you may remember that we went there with Dr. Lee and they collected something over there. And then uh, after that, we put these uh, samples into DNA extraction and uh, we find out the ultra conserved elements and uh, we collected almost 3,000 of genes to get the phylogenetic tree. So the, the program here is what we use for reconstructing the trees. So these are the pictures. Those are, they, they, look, they all look a little bit different from each other because they are monophyletic lineages in different geographic areas. So when we test it, uh, you can imagine that when, we, when you have 3,000 genes, you actually need to do a lot of uh, analysis. So you need to find out a very powerful computer. So for those, uh, you see those sites that we constructed, uh, we can actually identify that into one, two, three, four, four big lineages. And then those lineages are all, my, all strongly supported statistically. So, so here is an interesting question. If we go back to the, the map, oops, stop it. If we go back to the map, oh, excuse me, uh, jumping around a little bit. If we go back to this map, it actually matches the, the uh, proximity or the closeness of these geographic areas. So here is one big lineage, here is another one. And here is another one. So you can see those three lineages sitting side by side. The uh, biogeographic process or scenario is actually different from those island populations. So let's look at into the de details of, of, the, of the geographic capacity testing. So here is the, blue, the purple lineages over here. It's on this island chain. Surprisingly, there is nothing found in Taiwan. So you can see there's a geographic gap over here. So that's what I'm still looking for right now. I believe there are segmented spiders in Taiwan, but in the blue lineages over here is in the continental area. So here, the, after some hypothesis testing, the, the scenario is quite different because it's more like this dispersal or isolation by distance scenario to spread into these three crates in the, on the continent. But here, because we know that Sunderland area, but at some point of the geographic history, it actually brought down into several of the small, uh, smaller islands. So here is the Indo-Malay clay over here, which is our group or the sister groups of other Eastern Asian clays over here. So uh, after we are done with the analysis, we actually found out these hypotheses. So here is more like fragmented uh, lineages that vicariate uh, by the geographic land masses. 
And then here is another, another area, but it, it actually fact is first to the continental area. But once that this lineage reaches this area in the, uh, I can call it uh, the East China right now, it got spread into different huge lineages over here. So mostly divided by the river system in China. So this is how I use uh, a geno genomic methods to resolve a big old questions that is about 200 million years old. And uh, we actually collect, collected enough number of those uh, geno uh, genetic markers. And uh, we also can uh, easily test a lot of geographic hypotheses. All right, so this is what I want to kind of highlight in this talk. So when we have a powerful genomic tool and when we know how to conduct the, the modern analysis, it becomes very powerful to answer a lot of questions. So uh, later these slides, uh, in the following slides, I'm just going to show you several examples without explaining the details of these studies. So here is an example from uh, Philippines. As you can see here, this is a, a, a case of frogs. And we use the, we use the RASIC genotyping methods as long as we with the UCE methods to answer the geographic uh, questions in this area. So we can easily test the phylogenomic hypothesis over here. And also we can test the population genetic hypothesis over here. So this is the structure analysis in this area and different colors means different ancestries. So you can see there, there are several hybrid individuals here, blue and uh, yellow, and there are some purple and uh, blue individuals over here that is, that is hybrids. So we are not only answering the, the phylogenetic questions, we also can answer the population gen uh, genomic questions. And here is the more like a, P, a PCA analysis. And the, here is another example. This is the, uh, the study related to my dissertation. So as you can see here, there are some, some different behavior some spiders with different behavior. Now we call them uh, agrodynamic, but they, the, very, the very interesting behavior of them is the collector parasitisms, which means they steal food from other, from other spiders. And then we also use the UC to resolve the phylogeny and the, as well their, as their behavioral evolution. Hello, Pak Safriyaldi. Can you mute your microphone, please? <laughs> well, all right. Here's another case. Sorry, that, that's okay. Uh, here's another story, uh, another study that I'm doing right now, which is I use a lot of honeybee populations in different geographic areas. Uh, we haven't done anything in Sumatra yet. I, I believe they are there, but we don't have any samples from there yet. So as you can see, we can easily test the, the uh, geographic hypothesis using some updated analysis. And then we can uh, uh, pretty quick reconstruct the ancestral area of the population lineages from different geographic areas. And I think that that would be the last the next slide will be the last study. Okay, here, here's another interesting tool that we call it metagenomic methods. We use these methods to get the one, just one fragment of, of the uh, bacteria genome from which is parasites of the mosquitoes. And uh, this is called Wabakia uh, genomes, which will kind of uh, prevent the, uh, the vi dengue virus to live in the mosquito body. So that means you potentially you can use Wabakia to control the mosquito uh, 
population or use that to kind of decrease the dengue virus population. So we conducted that in Kaohsiung city and this map is the occurrence of the dengue fever cases in the city. So as you can imagine that the, the city government must spray a lot of chemicals over here to kill them, uh, to kill the mosquitoes. And uh, we actually, after we genotyped Wabakia in these populations, we actually genotyped about 500 mosquitoes in the cities in different spots. We found that the Wabakia diversity here in the central part, which is, has the high case of dengue fevers, was reduced to very, very low. And the, the suburban area, they still maintain really high diversity, which means if you actually use the mosquitoes from the suburban area, you can reduce the infection of dengue fever. So that's another application of using the, the modern genomic methods to apply to even the public health area. All right. Uh, here's the phylogenetic trees of these Wabakia uh, samples. All right. That's about all I, I have in this talk. And the thing, I would like to thank a lot of uh, funding agents and different collaborators from different parts of the world. And especially thank to the Andalus University and the Dr. Rizzotti for helping us in different times and different areas of my studies. And then my lab is called Ecology and Evolution and Genomic uh, Lab, located in Kaohsiung University. And uh, these, these are my lab members, including Johan over here. All right, thank you. If you have any questions, I will be happy to answer. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Su. Very interesting talk, yeah. And you have covered uh, a lot of area of study and uh, a very large geographical distribution for many different species in taxa also. And this is also much possible also to do such kind of study or implement this study in, in our region as well. And you starting from the history of your study yeah, and also goes to the application, yeah, application of, at the end. Yeah, this is very, very interesting. And, and also you've done some difficulties of, in the studies, especially in the pin, uh, when finding the ge genetic marker or something. And yeah, this is, I think, very useful also for uh, trying to find the uh, kind of the history of distribution or uh, the scenario of the distribution of each species or particular taxa or something. And probably from the audience, we have some question. Yeah, if you have any comment and question, please raise your hands. Please, your time. Hello? And also you can type your question in the... Uh, uh, yeah, please, Professor David. Oh, thank you, Raji, and thank you for who is very interesting. Uh, you can see that uh, how uh, fast the development of the molecular tool and molecular study. So you can stay at the, the, the moment. So we have to move and read, read, and read. Uh, interesting using a UCS uh, tool to, to study the biography. Uh, actually, we uh, for the last time we use um, the two genes that I said to, to working making a network uh, network a uh, net uh, haplotype network to study the by the dispersals or the evolution and original of the species, but uh, with uh, with the uh, UC UC uh, uh, tool. We don't have to to see the other gene that are uh, that are in the gene bank or others, so we can build by ourselves. Is it? Is it? Yes. Uh, right now, people submit their UC genetic markers to gene bank as well. But uh, it's not a common case yet. So uh -huh. 
this technique is a very young technique. It actually was invented in, if I remember correctly, 2012. It's about only 10 years ago, but start getting popular just recent years, in, within five years. So it's not a very common method yet, but it's very powerful. So that, that's why a lot of people are trying to use these methods. So they, we do have some, some gene bank data already, but it's not as popular as the single sequencing data at this moment. Okay, so with the UC, we, we can extract from uh, DNA nuclear or DNA non-nuclear, isn't it? We can use- uh, yes. As long as you can, you can develop the capturing probes. So whatever you target, you will be able to sequence them. So it's very, uh, very efficient, effective. Let's put that in this way. It's very effective. So no matter what kind of you know, gene markers that you are, you are interested, you can develop uh, capturing probes and uh, to capture that in the solution to sequence. So that, that would be the basic principle behind that. Yeah, so we can actually, for instance, we can uh, develop a probe for CO1 yeah. or cytochrome B. Yeah. So then when we are doing this, uh, this genomic works, we also capture traditional markers in the same time. Okay, thank you. So yeah. we have to try to do it. Yes, try to. <laughs> To apply if, you are, this. if you are interested in this kind of methods, I can certainly help because, or even Ilhan can help a little bit because he learned something over here already. Yeah, yeah. Thank right. you. Thank you, Rapsu. Yes, you're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you, Pat. Okay. okay, thank you, Prof. Levy and Prof. Su. Is there any more question from audience? Oh, somebody raised a hand. Oh, yep, yep, please. Please. Uh, okay, thank you, uh, Pak Rizaldi. Yeah, uh, please. Thank you to uh, Professor Su uh, for the presentation of the very interesting prof. Uh, permission to ask prof, uh, do morphological features support the study of molecular grouping? And what is the bioecology of arachnid? Okay, thank you, Prof. Well, I'm sorry, can you, can you repeat your question again? Uh, do morphological features support the study of molecular grouping? And what is the bioecology of arachnidae? Uh, Dr. Rizari, can you? Yeah. So, do morphological features support your molecular data? Oh, mor morphological features? Yes. Support, yes, yes. Uh, yes, because before that, we already have done a lot of uh, taxonomy work, which means we actually examine their morphology already. So that we, uh, before we started these projects, we actually know morphologically and even behaviorally they are different. So but we, we can find out the relationships between these different morphologies because they are too old and the common genetic markers that we use cannot resolve the deep relationships among these groups. So we, we know the difference among uh, of the morphology, but we don't know what comes first, what evolved first, and then what is the derived characters of these of these lineages. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, Aida, uh, what is your last question? Uh, bio questions. Uh, what is the bioecology of arachnidae? So what do you mean? So bioecology of arachnidae. Okay, so what is the bioecology of arachnidae? Is this your question? Yes, sir. Okay, yeah. Please, Professor Su. What, so is, the biology? what is the biology? Uh, uh, 
what is the bioecology? Bioecology. So what it means is because this is very large, very, very big, probably. So can no, you just simplify the question, Professor yeah. Aida? Uh, Dr. Uh, Aida, can you simplify your, your question? Make it. Uh, well, it, it is a very broad question, but I can yeah. try to answer some. Okay, yeah, so for, for the trapdoor spiders, because they are ancient and they are, but well, let's consider that's the prototype that we can see the, in the living sp uh, species that, that is kind of like the earliest or the oldest spiders in the world. So we can picture that as the, as the prototype of spiders. And the, from, from their behavior, they don't, they don't actually use their webs. They use their web to, do, to build their home, to build their a burrow underground. And then they, they put a cap, they kind of kept themselves in the, in the burrow. And then when they sense the vibration of outside, they came up to capture the insects outside. So that's how they, how they get, get their food, how they prey on other, other insects. So later on, when, when we go to the, if, we, if you see this, this one, so this lineage has actually kept some of these like natural histories. Some of them live in the, in the burrows on the ground. But for the lineage over here, they start building the uh, uh, webs in the air. So that's how, how and when they start getting diversified. So the species number over here is just like maybe less than 100. But here we have actually maybe, uh, I, I couldn't remember the exact number, but more than more than ten thousand of species within within this lineage. Okay, so this is a basic ecology of these of the of these spiders of the segmented spiders, and how that related to the other other like younger or current spiders. I, I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Su. And okay, thank you, sir. Okay, I think this is, is there any more question? Yeah, yes, Parizadi, there is one more question in the chat, um, in the text, the oh. box text. Yeah. So okay. uh, from Mutimanda, can you in, read that? In the chat, okay. Yeah. Okay, oh, yeah, okay. that's what's so, over here. Can so you find it? Okay. The methods I use are all, all list over here. Whole genome sequencing, Empricon or Meha genomics and the RASIC target sequencing and the RNA-seq. So these are the methods I, I can do in my lab. And I think at least Johan knows how to do this part, the second one. So if you want to, because Johan is there in Indonesia right now, and I, I'm not sure where, where Motimanda is right now. If you, are, if, you, if you know Johan, you can talk to him. Or if you want, you can actually email me at, at any, any point of time. And I can show you some more details about these methods. Is that good? Okay, yeah, sounds good. Professor Stu? Yeah, please, Mutimanda, you can contact also Yoham. Yeah, he's now in Padang. Yeah, okay, thank you very much, Professor Stu. I think now the time to jump to the second speakers. And again, thank you very much and for your talk, for a nice presentation. And for the next speaker is uh, Dr. Huang Yin Si. Is it correct pronunciation? Yeah, Dr. Huang is a uh, assistant professor at the School of Life Science at Kaohsiung Medical University. And his talk today is about in search for the food of God. Oh, this is very interesting. Yeah, in search for the food of God. Ambrosia, symbiosis between beetles and fungi. Okay, this time is yours, please, uh, Dr. Huang. Hello? Hello, Dr. Wang? We cannot hear you. 
Yeah, sorry. I mean, like, let me share my screen again. Okay, yeah. So. Hello, 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 hello. Can hello, everybody yeah. see my um, slide? Yeah, we miss your slide. We miss your share. Okay, interesting. Okay. I mean, so maybe like I can like disconnect my microphone and like try to link that again just in a minute. Okay, no problem. Yeah. Take your okay. time. Yeah. Uh, let me try how to do this. So, how about you talking? Mm, probably not. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Okay, I mean, um, it's so we can see your share very clear. So I think you can stop talking now. Okay, I mean, it's kind of interesting that I cannot share my screen and my microphone like at the same time so i mean i may try to i mean use another microphone please wait me for another minute i'm so okay. sorry about that yeah okay just take your time uh, yeah so, i mean can everybody see my screen and hear me at the same time yeah 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 nice okay okay cool nice okay. nice 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 okay so hello hello everyone I mean, my name is Inde Huang, and I mean, as, as you can tell that I'm not so old. So, I mean, it's really my honor um, to be invited here uh, because I just like um, got my job here last year. And I mean, I'm currently an assistant professor uh, at the KMU University. And today um, I will try to talk about uh, research about symbiosis. I mean, that's a symbiosis between beetle and fungi. And as you can tell from the name, um, uh, in the search for the food of God. So what does the, I mean, what does there have anything to do uh, with the food of God? Uh, I will explain it in a minute. So first of all, what is ambrosia? I remember, I remember that uh, when the first time that I got to the US and I saw, uh, and, and my uh, advisor over there, uh, he was in the at the airport and tried to pick me up. And then um, he drove me right away to a welcome party. And over there, there are many like newcoming students. And over there, uh, we have a small, we had a small chat, like, um, do you like the food here? Um, do you like the weather here? And do you have like jet lag? And I mean, of course, I just finished my 20 hours fly over there. So of course I did have jet lag. And like, and we have this old small chat and all the way um, to my research topic. And I remember Eri, uh, my advisor, um, who just threw out maybe like six, seven different topic and asked me which one I want to do. And I mean, I didn't have too much idea what to do for my PhD. So Iri, who just kind of like randomly pick up a topic for me and say, how about we do embryosis and biosis? I mean, that was the first time that I met my advisor. And you don't want to disappoint your advisor at the very first time you guys met, don't do. So, I mean, I just pretend that 
I know what he was talking about and say, oh, okay, for sure, let's do M versus Embasis. And when I got back to my dorm and I turned on my laptop, laptop and start Googling, what is Ambrosia exactly? And this is what I found. Ambrosia is an American variety of fruit salad. That's according to Wikipedia. I mean, I was thinking like, and I just joined in a forestry entomology lab. Why should I, what do I have to do uh, deal with the fruit salad? So it must not like the cast. So I kept Googling. Then I found Ambrosia, that's a term that occur on the side of a, a restaurant and on the side of a grocery store. So I started to pondering a, a word that's showing up um, on the grocery store, on uh, the restaurant, and at the food. So what is that? Then after a couple hours of Googling, then I figured out that Ambrosia, that's actually a word, a Greek word that literally means um, the food of the gods. So Ambrosia symbiosis that we talk about today um, is uh, about is a symbiosis about food, about nutrient, and about the food of the gods. So um, here, uh, here is the typical view. Um, if you peel off the bark at the right time, and you basically see the whole family of this beetle and fungi. And as, as you can see here, um, these are the adult beetle, and this is lava, and this is the pupae. And this white stuff that are uh, their, fun their fungus. And these fungus, they are the sole nutrients to these beetles in the system. And in return, these beetles, um, they are the only vector for this fungus to like in the environment. Image that if you are being taken by a beetle uh, in a tree where there is no rain, there is no um, wind, and the only way that you can get out in the environment is by hitchhiking on these beetles, isn't it? So Ambrosia symbiosis, that's essentially a fungus farming agriculture of these beetles. These beetles, they form their fungal crops in the system and take these fungal crops with them to colonize another land. So before we dive into today's topic, uh, I want to show you the real size of these ambrosia beetles in real life. Most of them, um, they are just a half size of a rice grain. Most of them are just like uh, three to five millimeter, and for the smaller one, it could be like one to two millimeter, and for the monster one, it could be like um, 10 to 15 millimeter. I mean, that's a monster size in ambrosia beetles. But I mean, indeed, um, most ambrosia beetles, they are super tiny. So, I mean, the symbiosis that we talk about today, um, they are all happening in this tiny creature. So, where can we find this ambrosia beetle? Basically, they're everywhere. Uh, you can find them in the city, you can find them in the rural area, you can find them in, uh, of course, the natural plants. For, for example, uh, if you hang out with a friend uh, in the park during sunset and with a beer on your hand, it's very likely that uh, you will see some like tiny little beetle flying, flying around you. They're very likely to be ambrosia beetles. And I mean, why? I mean, why they are being, I mean, why these beetles, they are being attracted by your beer? I mean, I will explain it in a minute. And most of these ambrosia beetles, they are wood borers, which means they live in tree. And these ambrosia beetles, they don't pick up a random tree to colonize. Instead, they prefer to attack the freshly dead tree or the stressed tree. And when they get into the tree, um, they will start to make uh, their gallery as a home in the woods. So how do these ambrosia beetles, they find the suitable tree for them? I mean, for this stress the tree, um, they will emit, emit like some chemical cues, such as um, the ethanol. 
And that's why um, these beetles, they are being attracted by uh, the beer on your hands rather by you. I mean, like this ethanol that can attract these beetles. So when these beetles, they are being attracted by the ethanol and they will fly onto the tree and start to bore into the tree. And as these beetles boring into a tree, um, they will push out the wood material as they don't really need it for their consumption. They eat fungi. So this push out wood material, they will form a packed tissue called frost noodle. I mean, from a distance, it looks like a spaghetti stick on a tree. I mean, just so fun to watch. <laughs> and when these beetles, they get into a tree, um, they will start to make gallery. That's the home of these ambush beetles. And as you can see, um, this is the mother tunnel, and this is the mother beetle. And when this beetle gets, when this mother beetle, they get into a tree, uh, she will start to uh, lay her eggs along this mother gallery. And as this egg hatch out, um, these lava, they will start to crawl, they crawl out uh, red radically. And like uh, over there, this is the pupa chamber of these beetles. And so you can see this white stuff, um, that's, I mean, the whole gallery, um, that's basically um, the fungal garden of these ambrosia beetles. So how about we zoom in inside the fungal garden? And as we zoom in the fungal garden, and you will see at the end of the pupa chamber, and you can see what this uh, white pearl stuff. And as we zoom in even further, and you will see uh, this is the uh, conidial gene cells of this fungi, and these big fat spore, um, they are um, the, uh, the, the thing that these beetles fit on. So, I mean, for this symbiosis, this is a mutualistic symbiosis. So we can expect that there may be some mutualistic co-adaptation between these two entities. For example, um, the embryo fungus. This fungus, they produce the ambrosia cells, which, is the, which are the swollen cells. And in these swollen cells, they have larger space uh, to store nutrients for the consumption of these beetles. And in return, these beetles, they have a specialized structure called mycangin. That's basically a fungal pouch. So these beetles that use this uh, mycangin, this fungal pouch, to very specifically select their uh, symbiont, their fungal symbionts and transport them while dispersing. And here you can see um, this is the micro CT. This is the uh, a scan of uh, a beetle. And at the head, like near the mandible, and you will see um, uh, this whole thing that is a mycangin, and inside which this red stuff that is the fungal spore. So these beetles that use this special structure to carry the fungus around. Oh, by the way, I mean, can you guys see my lesser? Yes. Okay, cool, 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 cool. I mean, so how about we talk about the evolution of agriculture in animal? I mean, actually, throughout the animal kingdom, um, there are only four uh, species that can carry out the agriculture in a systematic way. Um, the first one, of course, is the ambrosia beetles that we talk about today. And the ambrosia beetles, I mean, that's actually, um, I mean, it's comprised of like two subfamily. The first one is platypodinae, and the second one is the scolotinae, these two subfamilies. And for the platypodinae, that species, they figure out their agriculture around like 100 million years ago. And for the scotinae, uh, they figure out their agriculture around like 30 to 50 million years ago. And around the same time, um, the fungus farming termite, the fungus farming ants, they also figure out how to do their agriculture. So do anyone, does anyone know what is the force? What is the last one figure out the agriculture? 
I mean, of course, that is, that is us human. We human only figure out our agriculture around like 0 0.01 million years ago. So that is a very short history compared to all these um, insects. So we do have a lot of things to learn from these um, amazing creatures. Um, so, I mean, as we learn from our history, um, we know that um, back in 10,000 years ago, which is like 0 0.01 million, million years ago, we human, uh, we figure out our agriculture independently around the world back then. <clears throat> for example, uh, for the tribe in Yellow River region, uh, for the people in Crescent, and for the people in Americas. <clears throat> I mean, peoples around the world, um, they adapted to their local climate, um, their, local, uh, their local crops, their local animals, and start their first agriculture independently around the world. Actually, there are several dozens of domestication events back then. So, can we see the same thing, this independent origin of agriculture in ambrosia system? Yes, of course. I mean, for these ambrosia beetles, currently uh, we have uh, we we knew like there are like three thousand four hundred known species for these ambrosia beetles, and there are around like twelve to sixteen types of independent origins of these beetles, and most of them they derive from their bar beetle ancestors. And for these bar beetle ancestors, they live and feed in fallen, and they have a facultative relationship with their fungi. And when they transfer, when they like give rise to the ambrosia lifestyle, they on these ambrosia beetles, they live in xylem, and they have a very, uh, they have a, an obligate mutualistic relationship with their fungi. So why switching? Why these barbitos ancestors, they would like to switch to this ambrosia lifestyle? And here I want to talk a bit about um, the plant anatomy. And as you can see here, um, this is the cross section of wood. And the outermost part, that is the outer bark. And inside a little bit, that is the inner bark and folden. That's where uh, this plant used to carry uh, sugar stuff, is organic compounds, and all this good stuff. So this is a very nutrient-rich plant. And when we go deeper inside, that is the step wood and the xylem, uh, where the plant used to carry only the water with minimal nutrients. That's a very nutrient-poor area. So why these barbitos, they would like to switch from this nutrient-rich um, plant to this nutrient-poor area? I mean, to be honest, we don't know just yet. But I mean, like, um, the advantage for these ambrosia beetles, uh, uh, when they get into the xylem, uh, what's the ecological advantage for them to doing so, to, uh, to, do, to do so? Like uh, we say, uh, by cooperating uh, with these uh, fungal symbionts and these um, ambrosia beetles, uh, they can physically separate their ecological niche. Like uh, they can physically separate their ecological niche into the xylem, where it's not accessible to their barbital ancestor. And also by cooperating with these fungal symbionts, they can expand their uh, the tree species they can explore, because this. And brush beetles, they don't really rely on the wood for uh, nutrients. Instead, they, uh, as long as their fungal symbiont can grow happily on the wood substrate, these beetles, they can live there. So by cooperating with these fungal symbionts, um, these embrasia beetles, uh, they can uh, separate their niche and also to expand the tree species they can explore. So with such um, a 12 to 16 times of ambrosia lineages, um, can we expect to see um, there are different fungal pouches? Yes, of course. 
I mean, there is a diversity of mycangents of uh, in this uh, system. For example, some species they have the oral pouch mycangia, which is the mycangia just next to their uh, mandible, next to their mouth. And for some species, um, they have their mycangia on the pronotum. And for some species, they have the mycangia at the base of their front leg. And some species, they have it on the electron. And some of them, they even like dig deeper into the mesonotum, uh, which is the place um, between the pronotum and their abdomen. And for some species, they have their mycangia grow in a crazy way that they have the open as the uh, front, the, the best of the front back and grow spirally in the body. And some of them, they have that grow all the way to um, the, their mesonotum. And some of them, they have a big, a huge disc on their pronotum. There is a huge diversity of mycangium in these embryo So with this different fungal pouch, can we, again, see, um, do they carry the same um, fungal symbiont? I mean, of course, they carry like a diversity of fungal symbiont as well. I mean, this is the, uh, this circular phylogeny, uh, that is the phylogeny of fun the fungal kingdom. And as you can see, um, these green lineages, um, they are the ambush fungi. And for example, um, the Raphalia B, uh, that's a species that was uh, that is being carried by this um, coxal cavity mycangium. And for these three type of uh, mycangium, this oral pouch, I mean, these three species, um, they are uh, different beetle lineages. They just happen to have the same uh, mycangium type. And for these uh, three type of, uh, for these three uh, beetle lineages, um, they carry uh, three kind of different uh, fung fungi, and for like Raphalia A, uh, like Fusarium, like Flapton. I mean Flapton, that's a uh, basidial fungus, by the way. And this Raphalia A was is also like being carried by another type, by another two type of mycangium. And for the species down here, I mean this big fat spore, this, this big fat fungal symbiont. I mean, they're very, very specifically carried by this uh, big and complex uh, mycangium. So, I mean, in general, um, this black, this small and primitive um, mycangium, um, they have a less specific uh, relationship with their, fun with their fungi. And in contrast, this uh, large and complex uh, mycangium type, they have very specific uh, relationship with their fun with their fungi. I mean, there's somebody who have carried out uh, like uh, uh, NGS uh, experiment, and uh, they, they 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 try to survey uh, what is the fungal community in these like oral pouch mycangium, and they found that the dominant uh, fungal symbionts in this oral pouch is account account for only like of 50, 60 percent, and like compared to that, uh, when they do the NGS data on this mesonotum pouch mycangium, they found um, their dominant fungus account for like 80 percent, 90 percent of the uh, fungal community. So these big, uh, large, complex uh, mycangium, they have a more specific relationship with their fungi. And I mean. Um, so how about we talk about the ambrosia fungi? I mean, for the ambrosia fungi, um, they have a comparable size uh, of the known species. There are around like 3,000 known ambrosia species. And most of them, again, like arise from, uh, like they have like certain types of independent origins that give rise to um, like the ambrosia lifestyle across the fungal lineages. And most of them, I mean, they are they also like derived from the bar beetle associated fungi. So, I mean, with such a diversity of this ambrosia fungi, um, can we like generalize some features uh, for this ambrosia fungi? I mean, we found that these ambrosia fungi, 
I mean, most of them, they produce the ambrosia cells, which is the, the swollen cells. And also, uh, these ambrosia fungi, they provide nutrients to their beetles. And third, these ambrosia fungi, they are dimorphic. So how about we like go through these points, like point by point. And first, the swollen cell. And as you can see here, I mean, this is the uh, phylogeny across the fungal kingdom. And these green lineages, they are ambrosia fungi. And these um, like pinkish, this orange like lineages, they are the bar beetle associate fungi. So as you can see, these green lineages, these ambrosia fungi, um, they have a, they have a spore way more larger than their bar beetle ancestor, their relatives. So as you can see here, the, the, the spore here is much bigger than this one, and this one is much bigger than this one, and this lineage is much much bigger than their relatives. So in these swollen cells, I mean, we assume that they have a larger vacuum space to store the nutrient stuff to feed their beetles. And we think that is a, a that is an adaptation for the symbiosis. And this kind of thing, this swollen cell, is not only seen in um, ambrosia symbiosis, but also in other uh, insect uh, fun fungus farming systems. For example, uh, like the fungal symbionts of these fungus farming ants and these, these fungal symbionts of these fungus farming termites. These fungal symbionts, they produce a larger spore compared to their relatives as well. And second, uh, the nutrient provision. I mean, this is a long-term observation that we think uh, this ambush fungi, they provide nutrient to their uh, beetle host. But it's until this thing, um, they experimentally demonstrate that um, this, is a, this is the case. Uh, for example, uh, this team, uh, they took the ambrosia beetles from the field into the lab and reared them in the lab. And this team, uh, they took out uh, this egg from the gallery and put that, I mean, and carry out a basic surface sterilization. And then put this egg on a um, sterile filter paper and water them uh, with, and watering them with like uh, sterile water. So under this condition, um, they, they can generate the aposymbiotic beetles, which is the beetle uh, that's free of fungus. So they fit on the fat on uh, these aposymbiotic beetles with three different kinds of treatments. First, they fed these beetles with the natal fungus, which is the fungus that they isolate from the gallery. And second, they fed these beetles with um, the fungus that's uh, very close to the, their natal fungus, but not the, the exactly one. And three, they fed these beetles uh, only the agar plug, but, not, but I mean, without any kind of fungus. So as you can see the bar graph here, um, um, it's only the natal and the non natto treatment that um, these beetles can have offspring, but not in the non-fungus uh, treatment. So this thing, they use this uh, very straightforward experiment and like experimentally demonstrate that uh, these ambush beetles, uh, these ambush beetles, they need their fungi to thrive. And the third point is that um, these ambush fungi, they are dimorphism. They're dimorphic. And I mean, these ambush fungi, they can switch between yeast and filamentous form depends on where they are. And for example, um, here is a cross section of the head of this video. And like, um, as you can see here, uh, this is the eye, and this is the antenna, and this is the mandible and this is the brand of the, of the beetle. And these two circles, um, they are their mycangion. And inside this mycangion, and as you can see, um, these, this, is our, uh, this is their ambrosia fungus. 
And this amber fungus, they grow in East Warren, uh, in the Mackenzie. They propagate themselves by budding. And when when these amber fungus, they are discharged. Uh, they they uh, they are discharged into the gallery, into the woods. And this is um, and this like amber fungus, they will start to turn into mycelial foreign and like uh, to start to colonize to crawl um, the uh, wood substrates. And at the end of the mycelia, they produce spores to feed their beetles. And when these uh, fungi, they have to like turn back, they have to get into the mycangion of the newly emerged beetle doubt, they turn back to their mycelium, their east born into the, my, uh, into the mycangion. So these fungus, they can switch between east born and mycelium born, like depends on where they are. So with all this like phenotypic trait that we have talked about, like um, for this amber beetle and fungi, they have co-evolved with each other for such a long time, for like um, for a million years. So can we expect to see like is there any metabolic adaptation of this amber fungi? And to answer this question. Uh, I carry out an experiment and like to ask this question from two uh, perspectives. First, do different ambush fungi they eat in the same way, which is the eating pattern of this ambush fungi? And for that, uh, we measure uh, their carbon, uh, their like carbon usage to uh, to 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 see uh, do this do this fungi eat in the same way. And second. Uh, we ask, do these different ambrosia fungi that feed their beetle host in the same way? And for that, uh, we study their metabolite, their metabolic profiles of these um, ambrosia fungi. And we took um, the multiple phylogenetic origins of these uh, ambrosia fungi as a natural experiment and select like six pairs of ambrosia fungi across the fungal kingdom. And that includes uh, the Ascomycota and the Bestiomycota. And in each pair, uh, we have, uh, we include an ambrosia fungus and a non ambrosia fungus as a counterpart. And with such a design, uh, we can ask questions like, uh, is there any differences of their eating pattern and the feeding pattern of an ambrosia fungus? compared to uh, their non ambrosia relatives. And for this, uh, we study, uh, like, is, is there any, like, metabolic differences that was caused by different lifestyle? And also, we can ask question, like, is there any evolutionary origins, uh, it's, sorry, is there any like, evolutionary convergence of this distant related ambrosia fungi? So to generate their eating pattern profile, uh, we inoculate uh, this fungi on a microarray blade and on which uh, they have uh, like 192 different carbon sources. So we can measure, uh, we, we, we measure like uh, how they grow in this well and like to get their catabolic profile. And for the feeding pattern, uh, we uh, mimic the way these beetles inoculate their fungus in the in the branch by like scratching some of these fungal tissues uh, using this uh, stereo toothpick and like stick into the branch and let them to grow maybe like um, one month to three months depends on their growth rate and then after that we took uh, the fungal tissues. Uh, this, this mycelium, this spore, and extract the metabolite from these uh, like fungal tissues and run them through the UPLC um, to generate um, their uh, feeding pattern profile. And because we want to study the evolutionary, evolutionary convergence of this average fungi, so we have to generate a way uh, as, the, as the phylogeny variable. And for that, uh, we firstly uh, generate their sequences, 
and calculate their phylogenetic distance uh, from these sequences, and then infer the eigenfactors from these system metrics uh, and use these eigenfactors as our phylogenetic variables. And as you can see here, uh, for these different levels of uh, uh, phylogenetic eigenvectors, uh, for example, uh, for the axis one, it could like uh, corresponding to the species level differences of this fungi, and for the axis two, it could represent uh, maybe like the family level differences, and for the axis three, uh, it could represent the genus level difference, and so on. And here is what we found. And on the left hand side, that is the eating pattern. And on the right hand side, that is the uh, feeding pattern. And uh, this, uh, this green dust, uh, they are the ambrosial lineages. And this orange dust, they are uh, these non ambrosial lineages. And for the species, and for the dots from the stand shape, uh, it means uh, the species from the stand phylogenetic origin. So as you can see on um, these uh, ordinations, um, you can see uh, these green dots, they basically don't cluster together on either the eating pattern or the feeding pattern. So it's such as that these ambrosia fungi, they're not necessarily to share uh, their eating pattern and feeding pattern. And instead, um, these dots with the same shape, uh, these squares, uh, these circles, these triangles, they kind of like cluster together on the plot. So it means that these ambrosia fungi and non ambrosia relatives, they share a very similar uh, eating pattern and feeding pattern. And we can see the same thing in the homogeneity test. And for this, uh, we uh, let's basically test the beta diversity of this uh, metabolic profile. And for this, uh, we hypothesize that because these ambrosia fungi, they give rise to a very specific lifestyle, which is the ambrosia lifestyle. So, so we assume that uh, these fungi, they may have a narrower um, metabolic rate. But as you can see on this test, um, these ambrosia fungi, they actually have the metabolic rate as broad as their non ambrosia relatives. There is no significant differences between these two bars. So, I mean, as you can see here, these ambrosia fungi, they may not share the same uh, metabolic profile. So how about we look deeper uh, into um, the, uh, the, the, like, uh, the, the, how many variations that can be explained by uh, these variables? And again, the uh, left hand side is the eating pattern, and the right hand side that is the eating uh, feeding pattern. And as you can see, the phylogeny alone, it alone can explain like 59% of the metabolic variation uh, in the eating pattern, and 31% in the feeding pattern. And in contrast, this ambrosia lifestyle can explain only 3% in eating and 0% in feeding profile. And this overlap here, it means the shared variation is that is planned by both variables. And as you can see here, um, they, uh, they are not interact with each other whatsoever. And the bubbles up here, that means like different levels of eigenvectors can explain how many variations in these profiles. And as you can see, um, the, uh, these different levels of eigenfactors, they can accum uh, accumulately explain lots of the variation in both profiles. And the bubbles down here, uh, that means um, like uh, the contribution of a specific taxon to the eigenfactors. And so we can see um, the species from the same phylogenetic pair, they basically have the same power contributes to the eigenfactors. So, I mean, this result told us that um, the phylogeny, it can explain most of the eating 
and feeding pattern, but not the ambrosia lifestyle. So how about we look even deeper into the metabolite? And this, this volcano plot, I mean, uh, that's the uh, shared metabolite of like 10, uh, 14,000 metabolite that we found uh, a across our uh, test fungi. And the right hand side, that's the metabolites that are highly expressed in this ambrosia fungi. And on the left hand side, that's highly expressed in non ambrosia fungi. And above this line, that is the statistically uh, uh, significant um, metabolite. And we love our uh, 0.05 p, uh, p value. And as you can see here, um, these are uh, the detected 509 uh, metabolites that are highly expressed across our fungal lin and brucia, uh, lineages. And we threw uh, these metabolites on the database and found and identified like 31 of them. And we found these metabolites, most of them, they are lipid or the lipid derivatives. So we assume that this, uh, this lipid compound, this energy-rich lipid compound, may play some role as, uh, as the symbiosis currency, as these beetles uh, give rise to the ambrosia lifestyle. So how about the metabolic adaptation of this ambrosia fungi? We found that, I mean, uh, for uh, this ambrosia fungi and non-ambrosia fungi, we found that um, they have a very conserved metabolite uh, metabolic profiles between each other. So which means this ambrosia fungi, they inherit lots of the uh, metabolic legacy from their non-ambrosia relatives. And we found there is no convergence of these uh, distant related ambrosia fungi. So, I mean, so far, it doesn't sound like a super like exciting finding because we didn't find like um, the thing that make ambrosia and ambrosia, right? But I, but I guess, I mean, there is one thing that is more important than that. Because these ambrosia beetles, I mean, these ambrosia, these ambrosia beetles, they live in the environment in very, very different ecological niche. For example, like for some ambrosia beetle species, uh, they, prefer, they prefer to attack uh, the small twigs. And for some ambrosia beetle species, they prefer the larger tree trunk. And for some species, they prefer to uh, live in the living tree instead of the uh, freshly dead tree. And for some peculiar species, they even like um, the uh, well-decayed tree as their substrate. <clears throat> so these different ambrosia lineages, they live very, different, uh, very differently in the environment. And also, these uh, ambrosia beetles, they cause the harm, they cause the disease um, to, our, to our society or to the environment, to, the, uh, to their tree host in varied ways. Uh, for example, um, this mountain pine beetle, uh, they kill the tree by massively, by massively attack the tree and deplete um, the resources of the tree and eventually kill the tree. And for some species, like the Eualasia species, um, they, with their fungus, that can uh, like uh, induce the production of talus. I mean, talus is a thing that uh, feed plant, this tree, they use to prevent the spread of um, this fungal spore in their uh, vascular system. And when uh, this tree, uh, they are being embedded by these beetle and their fungus, it's kind of like the tree will like overreact to this um, like invasion and over overproduce the tadus and like even and eventually like stop um, their water transportation, uh, their nutrient transportation, and eventually kill themselves. And for some species, uh, like this Salatendra uh, crisis colors, that's a, that's a worldwide species, and they can like uh, they can like attack lots of trees, different kind of trees, and they don't really kill the tree. 
but they cause the physical damage. So when these beetles, um, they occur in the nursery, in a nursery, and they will like cause a physical damage of this seedling and decrease the, eco the, the value of these trees. So these different beetle lineages, um, they like cause the harm to our human society in varied ways. So our result, back to our result, we kind of like um, phylogenetically, metabolically demonstrate that these ambrosia symbiosis, they're actually very, very different ambrosia symbiosis. And there is not only one ambrosia symbiosis, but many ambrosia symbiosis. And we should start to appreciate um, their biology, their ecology, their plant pathology, according to their um, phytogenetic origins. And lastly, I want to emphasize that um, the ambrosia symbiosis, that's really a, a, a playground for the study of symbiosis. For example, we can study uh, this symbiosis from their biological perspective. Uh, we can study that from their ecological and from the evolutionary and from the plant pathology perspective. So indeed, that's a playground for uh, the symbiosis. So here is the take-home message. These average beetles and fungi, they are mutualistic symbiosis. And we can find them everywhere. And there is not only one ambrosia symbiosis, but many. And I mean, these ambrosia symbiosis can be studied from many perspectives. So I guess that's pretty much it. And thank you for your time. And I'm happy to take questions. OK, thank you very much, Dr. Wang. Yeah, very interesting sure. talk. Yeah. <laughs> and also, thank you for the tech home message. It's very clear. Yeah, I think we have some questions from the audience. OK, please, if you have any question. Okay, Dr. Wang. So, yeah. probably uh, I'm going uh, to ask you this simple question about this very interesting topic, yeah, about the symbiosis, fungi, and the beetles. Mm -hmm. And my question is do people recognize this as a pest for the agriculture or something? The, the symbiosis, the ambroxia? You mean like, is there any like, um, agricultural implications for this yes. study or like yes. for this system. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, of course. I mean, like, uh, we, I mean, as a researcher, we're like being funded by our government to deal with like real, real world problems. I mean, actually, these amber beetles, like some of them, like, I mean, we, we just say um, there are like 3,000 different amber beetles, but there are only like um, 10 to like 15 species that can really cause like huge damage to our human society. So, I mean, like um, the, the, the study, the research that we want to, um, why, we, why we would like to choose this system uh, is because that we want to find uh, why um, there's just a such rare species that like switch from these like separate uh, lineages into and become a very pathogenic, very pestiferous species. And we want to, and I mean, because we are in the edge, like we can generate uh, this uh, genomic, this transcriptomic, uh, this like uh, metabolomics in the in relative uh, cheap way. So, I mean, we want to like combine these omics data and like to find if there are any things that's been shared by these uh, past species. So, I mean, I guess, I mean, we are still on the way to figure it out. Okay, thank you very much. Is sure. there any question from the audience, please? Yes, Mr. Zaldi, Dr. Yeah. Zaldi, where? Yeah, please. Prof. Okay, thank you. It's very interesting uh, presentation and information. Uh, my question is for the, um, for the confirmation. Yeah. Uh, do the diversity of my Kangia, my Kangia, how we call it? Ikongia, my Ikongia, yeah. Ikongia, based on uh, part of uh, fungi they eat or based on the kind of fungi 
or species of algae. The diversity oh, of Mycungia, yes, I mean. Oh, you mean? You cannot hear you, bro. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, yes, my, my, my question is just for confirmation. Do the diversity of my kangia based on parts of uh, the fungi they eat or based on the species of fungi? Oh, you mean like the um, um, the relationship, the like the specificity of these opportunities, my kangian type and like different Fungi. Yes, and we, I understand we, it right. We saw we, we saw that uh, my kangiats have a different uh, what do you call it fungi parties. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, do they are different in fungi parties based on part of a kind of fungi they eat or based on kind of fungi, the diversity. Uh, the diversity. Do you mean like, um, yeah, I mean like, do you mean like uh, these different epitopitals they live in like different ecological niche that's like, because like um, they have like different fungi or like have different mycangian type or like yeah. what, like other varietals? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, I mean like, I guess like, um, that's a very interesting question. Like, I mean, we try to resolve uh, the phylogeny of these uh, embryopitos and like to correspond to their um, like ecological threat or like uh, like for, for some species, uh, they are like, they preferentially can attack like more species. And like for some species, uh, they only uh, like colonize very specific tree host. And for some species, they like um, I mean, for this difference, like uh, we call like polygeny, uh, like traits. But I mean, that is. Yeah, we can hear you, Doctor Wang. We couldn't hear. Hello, Doctor Wang. So we miss your voice. Hello. Hello. Yep. Can you hear me? Okay. Now, yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry for all these technical issues. Okay. No problem. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, like, I tried to use my earbuds, but I mean, to, to hear the question more clearly, but I mean, like, turn out they're not comparable to, they're like, they, 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 don't, they don't like each other. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, the, the question that you ask is like, um, like, is there any, like, ambership veto and their fungi that can determine their ecological, like, uh, breeze, right? Uh, so, I mean, I guess, like, we're still on the way to figure it out, but I mean, like, we, we find that um, the um, the ambrosia lifestyle, they're not necessarily, like, 100% uh, corresponding to um, the expansion of their ecological niche. And, and instead, like, for some species, they have involved uh, their their ability to colonize more trees, more tree species like even before uh, the rise of the ambush lifestyle. So, I mean, like, there's still like a unresolving phylogeny between this ambush of fetal lineages and the, uh, the ecological traits of this, um, like, of this, like, traits of these beetles. I don't know, I mean, I answer your question, like, clearly, but I mean, I guess this is the best I can give at this point. Okay, uh, I mean, if the... Sorry, I mean, uh, I can hear you guys. Hello, can you hear me? Oops. 
Oke. Okay. Halo. Ya. Halo, can you hear me? Ya, sudah. We can hear you very clear. Oh, yeah, nice. Oke. Right. Oke. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So, oke, okay, Prof. Day. Yes, uh, I mean, if the diversity of Metagia based on part, part of uh, Fungi they eat, so as uh, or by based on kind of uh, species of Fungi, I mean, if uh, if uh, we can say that as long as the availability of Fungi, the species will be not Uh, will not be extinct if the diversity based on kind of fungi, not based on part of the fungi they eat. Okay. Hmm. I mean, sorry. I mean, I don't quite understand the question. I mean, can you like maybe like explain this, elaborate that a little bit more? I, I'm not sure that I understand that. So I think uh, the question is about whether the extent of beetles yeah, depend much on the parts of fungi eaten or depend on the species of the fungi. Is it the question from David? Yeah, yeah, because there are several kinds of uh, fungi pouches They're in the head, in the... Uh, at the mouse. Oh. Yeah. I mean, like, this is the, the, the first part of your presentation. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, uh, I try to explain this if I understand the question right. I mean, like, for these uh, emergent beetles, most them they kind of, like, just associate with only one fungus, oh. like, with only one dominant fungus. So they don't, like, uh, they don't really, like, have lots of fungi associated with them. I mean, this, um, these beetles, although we just say that um, there is, are some type of mycangion that is not very, very specific with their fungal symbionts. But indeed, I mean, these mycangion still, like, they have their, like, mycangion that being dominated with, by, by, like, um, one genus or, like, one species of a fungus. So, I mean, even for this, that specific mycangion, there's only one uh, dominant fungus in their system. Okay. Yes. It's clear now for me. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay. So any more questions, please? <coughs> From student uh, in Andalus University, if you have any question, please. Radila Utami, Prof. Radila Utami. Okay, do you have any question, Radila, please? Yeah, you raise your hand. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Um, thank you for uh, Dr. Huang for the nice presentation and very interesting. So I'm studying uh, political primate. Therefore, this is quite new for me and especially about the Ambrosia fungi symbiosis. Um, this is the first time that I heard this. And my question is, Related to the common features that shared by the fungi, fungi that make them ambrosia. So the third uh, common features about the dimorphism. So is there any benefit for the beetles by choosing the dimorphism? Well, I mean, why not the monomorphism? monomorphism? Oh, thank you. I mean, like, I mean, dimorphism, that's a thing that, I mean, also a feature uh, for many kind of fungi. Uh, they, they, uh, they have to deal with uh, like different kind of um, ecological challenges. For example, like uh, for like human pathogen, for the pathogen of our mammals. I mean, we have to, this, this pathogen, these fungal pathogens, they, they also have the characteristics of dimorphism because they have to like deal with the, uh, the liquid and the solid environment at the same time. For example, when they live uh, in the fields, uh, in outside our bodies, uh, they have to like be in the mycelial form in order to colonize substrates. But when they like somehow they get into our stream, uh, they get into the liquid uh, environments, they have to turn to uh, the east forms so that they can spread 
more rapidly in our stream. So I guess the same thing apply to the Ambrose system, to these Ambrose fungi that they live in the mycangion, which is the relatively like liquid environment compared to their uh, this solid wood. So I guess that's why we can see these features for these Ambrose fungi. Mm, okay, I get it. Thank you. Uh, probably sure. one more list or more question. Yeah, please. Uh, yeah, it's related to the uh, the trees that chosen by the by the uh, beetles. So, especially for the living tree, is there any specific um, size or the specific um, you know like probably only they only choose the adult tree or fully grown tree? Is there any specific something like that? Oh, I mean, like, um, uh, for I mean, the, the specificity between um, the tree house and beetles. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, of course. I mean, like, uh, for for example, like the mountain pine beetle. I mean, they mm. they are very specific to colonize only pine, so that's why they are called mountain pine beetle. And for I mean, let me jump to the slide. Minutes. Uh, okay. I mean, there are many slides. Let me jump to there. And one minute. I don't know why I cannot exit the present mode and like jump over there, but this is the case. Here we go. Yeah. I mean, like for the mountain pine beetles. I mean, this is the pine tree, and this mountain pine beetles somehow they like pine tree very very like very, I mean they very like um, these pine trees they don't colonize any kind of like um, the tree any any kind of tree that is not conifer but I mean like for these like beetles um, they can basically attack like uh, lots of laurea plants they are basically the plants the tree species in laurea plant um, these beetles and the fungi can colonize them and so, I mean, like for these two, um, like Ambrosia beetles, they kind of like have very like different ecological niche. I mean, although they all come and they all have the fungus associated with them, but I mean, like by nature, maybe that's kind of like determined. I mean, that maybe that's determined by their barbito ancestor already that, I mean, these beetles, uh, their ancestor, they like live in fallen for million years and this live in this broadly for million years so i mean they're uh, distant even they uh, colonize and they even they have a uh, ambush of fungus associated with them they still like colonize the same like um, tree lineages mm, okay so uh are the trees only colon are the trees that colonize by the beetles only adult trees Oh, only a Dow tree. Oh. Uh, yes. I mean, I would say yes and no. I mean, like for this species, they kind of like nursery yeah. as well. Oh, I mean, like yeah. I mean, some some, some species they just like um to count as a larger tree trunk, which is mostly the Dow tree. But for some species, they prefer to attack the branch, mm. which is like a, I mean, in like smaller diameter. So I mean, these beetles they have their like um uh, like their their way to choose the beetle uh, to choose the tree. Mm, okay. Okay, that's great. Right. Thank you, Dr. Huang. Yeah. Thank you, Radila, and thank you, uh, Dr. Okay. Huang. Yeah. So actually we almost ran out of the time, but is there any more question from our DMs? I uh, actually Dr. Huang, I have uh, another more question. So do life history pattern influence the, so we know that the beetles and the fungi have a life cycle. Yeah, so my question, do life history pattern in both beetle and fungi influence the existence of uh, symbiotic? Oh, I mean like, um, do you mean like, do this beetle and this fungi, they have like a, Life cycle. Uh, a way to like, adapt to each cell, uh, yeah. to, to each other's, I mean, um, because of, because of yeah. they have a life cycle. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, actually, 
I mean, we, we say that uh, these fungi, they have to get into the newly emerged pterodiles, right? But actually, that's a very, very small, small window in terms of the uh, life cycle of the beetles. There's only like, uh, I would say, maybe like three to seven days that, I mean, as these uh, beetles um, develop, um, I mean, for, for the development of their mechanisms, there's only like three days to seven days window that can allow okay. this uh, fungi to get in. It, if the if it's not the case, if that fungi uh, didn't like uh, propagate itself enough to get into the uh, mechanism in these short windows, then these beetles, these newly emerged beetles, they will eventually die because they don't carry the right fungus. With okay. Them. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Huang. Sure. I think this time to end this session. And again, thank you for. Dr. Professor Su and Dr. Huang for a nice presentation. And I give back the time to Siumi. Please, Siumi. Okay, thank you, Dr. Zaldi, for hands over the season, the second season of this uh, webinar. Thank you for Dr. Huang and thank you for Prof. Uh, Su. And we jump up to the last session of this seminar. It's about closing statement from uh, Dr. Rizaldi, Andalus University. And the second is from Kosyong Medical University by Prof. Su. Maybe for the first, we directly jump to Dr. Rizaldi for the closing statement. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Probably better to give a chance first to uh, Professor Su because Professor Su would like to introduce the okay. uh, to ask the, about the KMU and some program, okay. and then later on we will close the uh, this seminar. Okay, thank you, yeah. Dr. Zaldi. Please, Prof. Uh, Su, for the introduction, KMU and the others. Okay, uh, can you see my share screen now? Yes, absolutely clear. That okay, option. great. Uh, so now I'm speaking as a director of the Division of Student Exchange at KMU. Uh, first, I would like to thank you for providing this opportunity to have this online shared seminar. We, I think we got very good questions and we actually get to know a lot of, well, very high potential like researchers in Indonesia, especially in Sumatra, I guess. Because I, I just got a message from Ilhan that we actually have seven universities in this webinar today, which is quite an achievement. So let me briefly introduce you a, a little bit about KMU and the, what we can provide, especially on the higher education on campus. So we are Kaohsiung Medical University. As the name says, we are a medical universities. So that means we have a hospital and a, a lot of medical doctors on the campus. We are located here. I don't know how many of you have been to Taiwan, but if you are flying from Sumatra to Taiwan, it takes about, uh, I guess if you do connected flight, it takes about six hours to eight hours. And then we are in the Southern part of Taiwan. And the, this is a, the, the big city in the Southern part of Taiwan. So it's very diverse and uh, a lot of tall buildings over here. In, the, in terms of food and culture, we are pretty diverse as well. So if you come here, you will encounter uh, a lot of people from different countries and uh, you will have different types of foods from different parts of the world. So we are right in the middle of the city, just in the, like, the, like the, the downtown area of Kaohsiung city. So it's a very crowded area here. The, the founder of this university is a medical doctor. So he, he came here for serving the medical service to the, during that time, the rural area in Taiwan. And then we are very, very keen or very, very, very involved in different kind of services to different part of the world. So the, in this part, for instance, that in good health and the well-beings, we are ranked in Taiwan number one. So we have a lot of academic programs. As you can see today, I'm going to introduce more on these PhD programs over here. 
And we only have somewhere about seven, less than 7,000 students on campus. And we even have our own academic journal. So here's the thing, we have four major parts in this university, environmental medicine or environmental studies and the regeneration medicines and the cell therapy and drug development and others and the cancer research. So it's more or less related to biomedical research. However, as you, as you already observed, we also have different parts of research like us, we are doing ecological and environmental research. So here are some other research centers that we visit over here. So we have a lot of hospital affiliated with us on, on, uh, nearby Kaohsiung. So here are the list of the hospitals. So that is to say, if you are coming here as a faculty or exchange faculty, or if you're coming here as an exchange student or the degree seeking students, you are safe in terms of your health problems. So if you have any, any health issues, you are, you are surrounded by medical doctors over here. So, as I said, we take a lot of social responsibilities. We serve to the community a lot during the history and, uh, and at this moment. So from uh, 1950s to right now, we actually participate in a lot of community serving projects in Taiwan and as well in different parts of the world. So we, we even served our medical uh, service to Solomon Islands and to Africa to another like very, very, uh, uh, the prey the study is very, very far away from us. So here is a, a little bit of description about the international students and faculty. We have a lot of international students from different countries, many from Southeast Asia. And then we also have a lot of visit, uh, visiting scholars and the visiting students exchange on campus. So if you, if you are willing to come here uh, for a short visit, later I will introduce you uh, a small program that we have here. So here is the, if you are applying for the formal academic programs, we have these two, two, two rounds. We have fall semester and then we have spring semester. So I will, dis I, I will distribute these uh, slides to everybody today so you can actually see the schedule of this. So basically you have to consult a potential professor on campus. For instance, during fall semester, starting from January to February, and then you submit your application online to us in February to March, and then you receive your results or admission in May, and then you will come here by July to uh, September if you are applying for fall semester. And then there is a schedule for spring semester as well over here. So if you are holding a master's degree and you are willing to uh, conduct a PhD pro, uh, degree, then it's a, it's a nice place. It's close to Indonesia and it's really easy to get over here. And then we also have a short-term internship in Taiwan. All right, and then these are the areas that we are interested. In. So biotechnology, medicine and biochemistries, public health, and the environment and other, other parts of the uh, uh, biological sciences related topics. So this is only like six months short-term visit. So if you want to take a look at Kaohsiung and you want to know a little bit about KMU, you are welcome to contact me or my staff in my office. So then we can provide you the information about the grant application for your short-term visit. So remember, this is included uh, students and uh, some of the faculties. And lastly, uh, I would like to introduce you about a, a scholarship structure in KMU. We have two, we have two types. One is the, the scholarship provided by KMU. So we have uh, three types over here, type A, B, C. And uh, there is another part is from the government. So, I'm starting from here, the KMU scholarship first. So I'm going to briefly introduce the type A because I expect most of you, if you are coming here, you will be seeking a doctoral degree. So basically you don't have to pay your tuition and then you get uh, monthly salaries from us. So it's enough to, for you to live in Kaohsiung and then the duration of the scholarship is four years. 
So if you if you want to know more, you can actually talk to Johan because he knows a lot of these scholarships. And on the other side, the governmental scholarship, I need to point out one thing, the elite scholarship over here, if you are doing a lecture, if you have any affiliations with any universities in Indonesia and you are holding a master's degree, uh, you, you are almost like 100% funded by these kind of scholarship. So that provides you the tuition, provides you the uh, monthly stipends for three years. And then we also have a Taiwan, Taiwan scholarship uh, with similar amount. So uh, that's the package for uh, international student scholarship. If you are interested in, in coming here to study your doctoral degree, but if you are aiming for master's degree, you will probably be categorized in the type B scholarship over here, but you still get a tuition waiver and a little bit of funding each month. Okay, so if you want to know more, you can scan, you can scan this QR code over here about the information of the scholarship. So the, the last part is about the activities over here. So you can see we have very diverse international student body. And then we actually went to a lot of interesting activities in different parts of Taiwan. All right, that's my very brief introduction to KMU. Thank you for your attention. And uh, again, thank you for NLS University to host this nice online Seminar. Thank you a lot. Okay, thank you, Professor, for introducing about KMU. Uh, one thing that I uh, remember that I'm sad if I'm there, yeah, because surrounding with the so many hospital there, and maybe you also share about the scholarship. Maybe the student who wanna continue uh, the doctoral degree, maybe we can contact uh, Professor or Ilham for the next information. I left my email address in the chatting box. So if you need my information, it's available over there. Okay, thank you, Prof. Su. Any other uh, question for the Prof. Su about the KMU University from the student or others? Or maybe any additional from Ilham about KMU? Uh, no, 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 that's still me. I think okay. Prof. has uh, explained it clearly. But maybe uh, if there is a student who wants to talk more about the KMU, absolutely, I will willing to share and sometime I will go into campus. Okay, thank okay. you, Ilham. Thank you for the sharing. Thank you, Prof. Su. Maybe we jump up to the second closing statement from Dr. Rizaldi. Are you ready? Yeah. With yeah. Thank you, Busiri. Uh, Pak Wilson is with us here. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Thank okay. you, Pak Wilson. Do you have any uh, comment, uh, something for the closing remark? I hope you can, uh, yeah, giving a closing remark uh, on behalf of you. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Paris. Okay, okay. No problem. Yeah, thank you, Pak Wilson. Yeah, uh, basically the idea of this seminar this is uh, to initiate the collaborations between uh, KMU and NRS University, but we are also open the chance opportunity to the other university in Indonesia, so that's why we also invite them. And uh, we want to know each other, this is the basic idea, we want to know each other and then we try to uh, arrange this uh, webinar and then asking some uh, invite some uh, speakers and basically we have uh, many potential speakers from both sides from KMU and from Andalus University but uh, unfortunately at this moment only uh, Bu Devi, Professor Devi have a chance to give have a uh, chance to give a talk probably for the next seminar we will invite more and because we have a plenty uh, we have a quite a lot of uh, aspect a lot of uh, people doing study for many different aspects, many different taxa of the uh, animals or plants and uh, so on. Yeah, and yeah, we know that we have a very big, very huge diversity. So, and Professor Su already experienced uh, some time uh, coming to Padang and traveling around West Sumatra with Ilham at the time. Yeah, and he knows well, the, he knows the situation in Indonesia. And probably you can also introduce the situation the condition and uh, 
possibility to the others in, in your university or in your site. And also for, <laughs> beside of the diversity, we have uh, many uh, human, yeah, we have a human resource also, and we have uh, uh, facilities and we have a natural resource that something that we need to do, we need to work, we need to collaborate to, uh, to do research and to improve our uh, uh, educational <laughs> Uh, institution and also to share the knowledge and experience experience between us. So this is the idea of this meeting. And for the next step, we hope we can uh, quickly implement this idea by making it formal. Yeah, formalize the idea. Probably we need to uh, write uh, some some uh, some kind of MOU between the both between the Andras University and the KMU. And if any other university involved, we are also very open for this. And there are several ideas for the collaboration. Yeah, it's not only a webinar like this, but already uh, Professor Su mentioned about uh, exchanging students, about internship program, about uh, probably we can have also some kind of program of visiting researchers or pro visiting professors and probably about, yeah, any any kind of program for capacity building between us. So we are really uh, open for this and we hope we can implement in, in the near future. And thank you for uh, Professor Su for initiate the collaboration. And also thank you for uh, Dr. Devi for presenting today, Professor uh, Dr. Huang and Dr. Su, yeah, for giving a very nice talk today. And we hope we can meet again in near uh, very soon. Yeah, uh, in uh, probably yeah in different moment, yeah uh, in different activity also. Yeah, and again, thank you for the committee for arranging the, this webinar, and uh, we nice. hope. Yep. Uh, I think Pro Henny want to ask something. I guess. Doctor Henny. Yeah. Do you have Dr. any? Dr. Henny raise her hand. Just yeah. right now. Uh, Dr. Henny, do you have do you have any question or comment? Uh, yeah, Dr. Zadi, I'm sorry because I have an additional class before, but this is already near the closing part. Yeah, right? we are soon okay. to close the meeting. <laughs> is it okay to speak something? Okay. Uh, to uh, uh, Professor Su, uh, I just uh, I'll say I just uh, saw your last presentation about the possibility of collaboration and some. Uh, very uh, promisable facilities in the university. So we hope uh, later our students or lecturers can uh, how say, uh, propose some uh, application for next uh, step of the study or uh, some collaboration in research. Uh, I'm Henny, come from Laboratory of Animal Taxonomy. And recently, my study is about uh, social insects, uh, including uh, bee and also ant, and some other students also working with um, butterflies and what else? <laughs> there are some pollinators. Uh, yeah. yeah. And I saw uh, the picture about a uh, bee farm in your university, so I'm very interesting. Uh, <laughs> eager to know about that because okay. uh, yeah there are so many uh, recent activities of mainly poniculture besides of apiculture so I hope in the future uh, we can have some opportunity to collaborate for research or uh, how to say explore the product of stingless bee for example uh, because there are so many product of them uh, for example they have uh, honey uh, bee pollen and also propolis that in our province especially of west sumatra uh, we, we cannot develop more than uh, only honey uh, as commercial uh, object so uh, there are still many other things that we need to study about and also to explore uh, so if if any opportunity to collaborate with your university expert or uh, researchers, uh, I'd be very happy, and I hope in the next future uh, we will can uh, do some um, closer communication and more detail uh, possibilities. Uh, maybe will be <laughs> appear. That's all. Uh, 
Dr. Rizaldi that I yeah. like to say. Okay, yeah. Thank uh, you, so Professor Eri. <laughs> oh, thank you, Professor Eri. Yeah. You should join yes. from the early. But anyway, that's good. Thank you for your comment. And <laughs> yeah, uh, on behalf of the head of the department, uh, so this is the time for us to close this meeting. Yeah. And uh, I will say uh, Alhamdulillah and success for all of you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank so, you. Prof, do we need to take a picture? Yeah, you, you want yeah, to me, yeah, probably we need to take yeah. some. So yeah. for Picture the section. audience, for the audience, please uh, mute your video camera so we can see your each other. Yeah. Yeah, uh, please do see me. For our audience, please. Yes. Okay, I will yeah. take the picture in three, two, one. Okay. Uh, maybe just one slide. Uh, Dr. Rizaldi and Ilham. Yes. Uh, I have talk. I have take the the picture. Right. Thank you. Okay. For the other okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, yeah. Professor Su. Yeah. yeah. See you in near future. Yeah. Thank you, oh. Prof. Su, Prof. Ko, Prof. Wilson. Oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, Prof. Rizaldi. Dr. Yeah. Su. Dr. Huang. Thank you. Yeah. 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 See you. Right. Thank you. Yeah, Bye. See you. Right. Thank All you, right. bro. Thank you. Yeah. Terima kasih. Yeah. Thank you, Pak Will. Thank you, Bu Henny. Thank you, Ilham. <laughs> Thank you, Bu Silmi. Makasih, Bu. Makasih, Bu Dewi. Makasih, Pak Dewi. Ilham. I get.